Grace and peace to you, everybody. Thank you for joining me. This is April Chapman with the Standard of Truth podcast. And today, I not only have a very special guest, but we are going to be talking about a very controversial topic. If you haven't figured out by now, I'm not afraid of controversy. I think controversy is good. I think it is healthy. I believe we should all have conversations that push up against our deeply held presuppositions. And in standard of truth fashion, we're going to be talking about something very, very sensitive and near and dear to many of our hearts. So we're going to have our brother Virgil Walker on today. We're going to be talking about did the civil rights movement fail the black community? If so, why? If not, why not? We'll also be talking about the Reverend Dr. MLK, the implications of his legacy and where we are today. All of that and more on the Standard of Truth podcast. All right, you guys, let's get into today's show. As you can see from the thumbnail, I have a very special guest joining us this afternoon, none other than my friend and brother in the Lord, Virgil Walker. I'm going to go ahead and bring him in. Hey, bro. Hey, what's up, sis? So guys, this was supposed to be an in-person interview. And guys, I live in East Jerusalem. Like I live really, really far, but technically Virgil lives really, really far too. He's in West Jerusalem. So we're on different hemispheres <laughs> of this city. And at the last minute, he was like, sis, um, I really need to do this virtual because I don't want to pack an overnight bag for a two hour interview. And so I obliged and graciously sent him the link. So we are not in the studio as I have planned originally, but it is still OK. Brother, how are you today? Doing well. Exhausted as usual. I mean, my days are full. Uh, with all the things going on with G3. Um, but yeah, we, we did a, a podcast this morning. We did a church network uh, meeting this morning. And so it's just a lot of, a lot of content, been talking a lot and uh, running around. I got, we wrapped up uh, our church network uh, content and I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to get to East Jerusalem. And <laughs> I like, he ain't gonna make it. And I thought I'm not. I'm probably not gonna make it if I if I can get things wrapped up. But you were very kind, uh, allowing me to to make it from here. So I, at I'm here at at the office in my office here at G3, and uh, just thought, man, if we could do this uh, virtually, it would it would work out, and hopefully it'll be a be, be a good time to, uh, that we'll, that we'll spend together. Absolutely. So many of you, you know, like I said on my show, we talk about some very tough things and. Virgil is no stranger to controversy. He has been pinning these articles every week for the entire month of January. And every time one drops, I'm like, bro, you have to warn me before you publish pieces like this. Because listen, I can, I can handle the heat, but I'm like, the average person is not ready for this information. So the first thing I want to do is I want to give a disclaimer, right? I need to disarm my audience because I want you guys to recognize that more importantly, I love the Lord but I love you too. Yeah. And there are going to be things on this show that we're going to talk about that you may not agree with. It's going to push your buttons. It's some of the stuff is going to make you outright angry. Right. But what I would ask is that you would seek the Lord, search the scriptures. And if we're in error based on the standard of scripture, we don't mind submitting and repenting. But what I would also encourage you to do is to abandon any sort of deeply held um, place in on the seat of your heart based on what you think you know and just allow the information to be presented and then wherever you land off of the at the end of the day that is fair and that will that is fine but i am going to you have you ever been in a room and it's been really, really dark and you've been sitting in this room and it's just like you're comfortable because it's dark. The lights are not bothering you. And then someone comes in and starts flinging blinds open and open up curtains. And you're like, wait, whoa, whoa, that's I wasn't ready. For 
that's what this show is. That's what that's what this show is going to be. Um, I had to deal and wrestle with some things on my own, and I'm I, I will abandon ship in a minute if I find out that information is not what I thought. I was like, well, praise the Lord that I know the truth now, but I know er everybody done deal with new information like that. So I want to be sensitive and I want people to understand this is not an attack per se on a movement. And this is not a character assassination on a person. What this is, is a healthy theological and Christian dialogue about historical events and information that can be fact-checked. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I feel exactly the same way. And I think it's good to kind of put that disclaimer out uh, because it'll, it, it allows people to kind of settle into let's let's take the emotion off. Let's put the emotion on the side. Uh, let's strip all of that back. Let's look at, at just from a factual basis, uh, more importantly, from a theological framework as, as believers in Christ and, uh, and and see how how put 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 things on the scales uh, and see see what's found wanting. Uh, I think I think that's really uh, my that was really my approach uh, to this this series that I'm actually putting out. So I'm really excited about it. Right. Because you're, you're between your Twitter feed and your Instagram. I was like, you know what? I don't think I want to be Virgil this month. <laughs> it was a dumpster fire. And I kind of as loquacious and outgoing as I am. I was like, you know what? I don't I don't even have words to jump in and help him out right now. I said, because I can tell people are not reading these articles. No. They're not coming to the table in good faith to hear the premise that you are articulating quite well, the backstory that you're getting. They're not doing it. And so I was just like, you know what? I'm going to just wait till I bring him on the show so we can get into it. So the two articles in question that I wanted to discuss, you did one um, about a week ago, and it was titled, Did the Civil Rights Movement Fail the Black Community? And then a week after that, you followed up with an article titled, What's the Truth About Martin Luther King Jr. And so first we're going to deal with the article that you penned on civil rights. And honestly, I, I like the backstory, the history, and you talked about Bookie T. Washington. I like, if you haven't read this article, by the way, I'm going to link it in the description box below. It was a masterpiece um, of an article that I, I believe deserves more attention. And, you know, as a Christian and as a conservative, I felt everything um, I'm, I'm a Booker T. Washington kind of Frederick Douglass kind of girl. Right. And so it resonated very well with me. But I want you to give the audience a little bit of insight as how when you opened up the article, you opened up with this quote that Booker T. is 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 on record is saying, talking yeah. about black people and their dependence on the government. <laughs> give me a little bit about why did you choose that? as the opening to the article and what did you want people to take away from that? Yeah. I thought about, I thought about Booker T Washington, particularly if people haven't read uh, his autobiography up from slavery, they absolutely should. It's a fantastic book about a, a man who uh, the, the book really starts with him uh, as a slave uh, learning about the fact that he didn't even know his last name. You know, he had to, had to pick that up. Uh, from, from you know after emancipation after the after uh, the, the the time of, uh, uh, of, of, of of you know uh, what is it right, right after um, the, the restoration kind of of the country things kind of getting back together he um, just made it up he just picked the name <laughs> he just picked the name absolutely picked the name thought it sounded good and, and went with it um, and, and but, but that was that was the norm for slaves during during that time the word I was think I was trying to reach for was reconstruction. Um, when I when I thought about his life and and what he was able to accomplish during a time of absolute segregation, I mean it was just it was just horrible uh, the, the time period that he comes from. Uh, for him to make this statement where black people are just coming uh, out of slavery, Reconstruction is taking place. He'd just been emancipated, um, and and during the course of his life, uh, it, you know, which was late late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds, he dies in nineteen fifteen. He, he, he writes this, the quote says this, quote, uh, among a large class, uh, there seems to be a dependence upon the government for every conceivable thing. Uh, the members of this class had little ambition to create a position for themselves, but wanted federal officials to create one for them. He said, I wished then and have often wished since that some 
power of by some power of magic, I might remove the great bulk of these people uh, into the country districts and plant them upon the solid and never deceptive foundation of Mother Nature, where where all nations and races have have uh, have ever succeeded have gotten their start. A start that at first may be slow and toilsome, but one that is nevertheless real. Um, I say I felt that. I felt I thought, that in my, my soul. <laughs> I, I, th I thought it was. I thought. I thought this statement was powerful, especially if you understand the context that 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 Booker T. Washington is coming from. Uh, again, context shortly after slavery. Um, you know, emancipation takes place. He's ready to to get educated and try to fit, try to fend for himself. And it's probably the, the the most dire time for blacks who either were were dependent upon a slave master, upon a slave owner to take care of them. Uh, now they're they're left to themselves. In fact, what was interesting, if you read his autobiography, he talks about how uh, you know they, they get the news that they're emancipated. Uh, the blacks on the on the plantation get the news that they're emancipated, and you know. All the all the younger people on the uh, you know on the plantation uh, are excited and ready to leave, but they, they don't know where they're going. Uh, they, they don't know what they're going to do next. Uh, all the older folks, he said, it was interesting to watch them because they would they would kind of chill back for a little bit, uh, and then uh, one by one kind of make their way up to the slave master's house uh, and, and figure out. Can yeah, yeah. And I'm not yeah. I'm not saying that mockingly. Well, I was mocking, but I'm trying to imagine. If I'm 60, 70 years old, I'm like, I don't know how to go out there in the world and do nothing. I'm like, listen, let's learn something out. I'm going to yeah. just stay here. I'm going to take care of y'all. But I can't go out there in that world because I don't know what's out there. Right. Right. What was interesting, too, about, about the story was that there were because of slavery, there were things that that those who lived in the house, the whites who, who were the slave uh, masters, did not know how to do, uh, which was why which was why a lot of the. Uh, a, a lot, uh, you know, a lot of the plantations were, were completely dilapidated because no, no white person really knew how to farm, knew how to, knew how to, uh, how to do the cotton, knew how to cook, knew how to do anything. So, so they, they, they both needed one another, and there were deals worked out uh, on that basis. So when I, when I had my mind in that framework, I thought, wow, what a, what a, a powerful picture, given what he's saying for us to consider as we witness what takes place. In the you know, late late uh, 1950s, early 1960s, as it relates to civil rights. Right. I mean, I when I read that, and I read it in the same context that you did. I said, wait a minute. Here is a a man who was born a slave, emancipated at the age of nine. He has no concept of what it means to really live and survive. But he he somehow, by God's grace, was like, no, I am a man. Right. I am an image bearer. I can figure out how to make it. So when he makes a statement that, like, if I could just drop everybody else in Mother Nature without any government dependence, it's going to be hard at first. Like a little baby, they, they're going to wobble and they're going to struggle. But eventually they will see the value in the fact that they can do it. And therefore they and they do. So when you open up the article with that, you dive right into talking about self-reliance, independence from the government, and then you segue into actually talking about the civil rights movement. And when most of us think of the civil rights movement, we think of marches, we think of, you know, we shall overcome, we think of, you know, segregation and Jim Crow. Um, for you, when, when you were writing this article and you were reviewing its past, can you talk to me a little bit about the evils of what was going on within the civil rights movement, but how the response or the the answer to fix those ills, which was the rise of MLK and all of those movements. Can you talk to me a little bit about why you do not believe that on some level they were a success, but then on others they weren't? Did that yeah. did that make sense the way I framed that? Yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah, I I, I like that. Uh <clears throat> when when I look at the civil rights movement, it began of course with Rosa Parks. So I start with her story. Uh, when I when I get to the article on MLK, I kind of reveal some things about even that story that many people are unaware of. But um, but but the, but the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955 was a big deal because it, it really it really launched uh, the the civil rights movement. Um, King was actually placed in the front of that movement. I think there were other players who who really organized and got it got it started. King was a gifted orator, and so he could really rally people. And so that was one of the reasons why he was placed in the front of, of, of what was what was happening there. 
uh, what was interesting to me, and, and I think there were things that, that there were things that the Montgomery bus boycott got right, right? Rosa Parks decides she's sitting actually in the front of the black section of the bus. She's sitting in the front of the colored section of the bus. I, the pictures that you'll see on social media will have her sitting in the front of the bus. And she actually mm -hmm. wasn't sitting that far. She was actually sitting in the front of the colored section of the bus. And uh, she was asked by the bus driver to move. And of course, we, we know the rest of the story. Uh, she decides not to and, and gets arrested. And, and, and then the march begins. Well, the, the thought was that they would, they would boycott. They would, they would stay off of the buses and, uh, and, and, and wait for the opportunity for uh, desegregation of those buses so that they could be rightly treated. Um, again, the other part of, about that that was, that was interesting is they only thought, King and, and other leaders, really thought it would be more like a one to three day event. Like they thought it was gonna be no more than, than a handful of days that they would be off the buses and that the bus system would capitulate and that would be it. Uh, well, the, the, the bus boycott actually ended up taking place for about 380 some odd days. I mean, it was, it was a long, it was more than a year uh, that it took place. Uh, when, when you think about the makeup of what took place and, and this this first boycott, I believe the civil rights leaders got right. I believe they got right. I just feel like they missed some pieces. And by that, here's, here's what I mean. They were, blacks were 70% of the patrons on the bus system. So they walk off of the bus system and the bus system and the city lose all of that, all of those revenue. So at the time it was about $3,000 a day. And then 2020, you know, $2,022, that's about 31,326 bucks a day that the city was losing. And, and if you go back and look at the, at the city budget at the time, it was more than a quarter of their budget that they were losing during the course of a, of, a, of a given time. So this had a massive economic impact on the city. The thing that was interesting was the, 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 the impact for blacks was exponential as well, because what we did was we took those dollars uh, or, the, or those dimes, because they were it was, it was about a dime, a, a, a 10 cents to ride the bus. And we ended up paying it to people who would begin uh, in our own in our own communities that would take us from A to B. So rather than paying the bus or the city, you were paying someone else within your own community that looked like you that was going to take you from A to B. Or you bought a or you bought a bike or did whatever, saved the money, what have you. But the economic impact in the black community again was exponential because we 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 made money. Now, unfortunately for King and for others, that was never the focus. What they created. Now, because they had to do this for a year, for 380 some odd days, they had to do this. So, uh, so it, it created an economic boom uh, in, in our own communities, but they weren't focused on that. They were so focused on desegregation uh, and, and rather than, rather than uh, self-reliance, uh, and, and all of this was done with the, the church was a, was a primary place where a lot of this stuff was actually happening. So, uh, the, they, they were pushing forward with that. And in the meantime, there was a Supreme Court decision, uh, Browder v. Gale, uh, that actually went up through the Supreme Court. And uh, it, 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 you know, they, they won. They got the, uh, the, the victory in that the buses were desegregated and a massive, massive blow was, uh, was, was struck uh, at, at Jim Crow. So the, the, the beauty of this is that, that, the, that the Supreme Court decision actually showed it, it tested the Constitution. And, right. and then in that regard, the Constitution maintained, it stayed, it, 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 it worked. Um, what would happen after was something different. I think that I think the, the, the system uh, that we began to, to, to choose to, to advance civil rights began to shift from, a, from constitutional tests, which it should have been, to civil rights acts. And, and there's a massive difference. There's a massive Can you explain to the audience what you mean by difference from upholding the Constitution as it stands and as it's always been written versus these acts like the Civil Rights Act. Can you make the distinction to help us understand why one would have been more favorable than the other? Yeah, what the, 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 the Constitution was the, the founding document of, of, of our nation. And so it established the, 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 the rule of law, how we should live, how we should be governed. Uh, and, and, it's, and it stands the test of time. These, the Civil Rights Acts, what they did was they had to be advanced by, by, by political parties. Uh, and so we had to then attach ourselves to whatever political party we felt would advance the cause of our rights rather than being connected to, to the Constitution and, and even the Declaration of Independence before it, 
which says that we're created, we were given, we're, we're all created in, you know, uh, and endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. Now we were, we were not, we were not uh, adhering to the idea that our rights were, were, were from God. We were actually saying our rights come from government and, and only insofar as a government, a political party is willing to, is, is willing to validate that, um, that's the direction we'll go. And so it, it, it would eventually tie us uh, to a democratic party, uh, not not because of some love that they had for us. They actually demonstrated over and over again that they didn't they cared nothing about black folk. Uh, but but for political expediency, uh, it was it was an opportunity for them to take advantage of a of a needy uh, a voting block uh, who who were, who were willing to to sign off dependency to a political party for the purpose of what they saw was advantageous. Wow. So it's interesting that you bring up the fact that, you know, what was good about the Montgomery bus boycott is that, you know, the, the desegregation that happened as a result. However, such a huge missed opportunity. And I was talking with Jason of Dear Will Christian today and I was talking about, I said, you know, why is it that you think like why historically not all people feel this way, but historically black people always have this sense of inferiority where we're like, you know, well, if I could just have what they have over there, you know, then I'll be accepted versus recognizing like you're already acceptable. You're fine the way you are. You don't need to feel like you need to have exactly what they have over there in order to be treated a certain way. And I think that mindset is how they missed this opportunity. Like we literally had the first Uber system. Right. And I find that because we don't spend time, we spend more time. And like I say, y'all, y'all, y'all already know on this platform, I say what I want to say. And if it makes you upset, you'll be okay. But we spend more time whining and complaining than building. Like right. this was a key opportunity. Like, well, wait a minute, these black dollars, when we pulled them out the local economy, almost bankrupts the city. We were on to something. We were actually being innovative and we were building something that belonged to us. Like, I remember when you go to an HBCU, one of the, the overarching statements, they always say, you either find a way or make a way. We were making a way, but instead we were like, okay, well, now that the buses are desegregated, I just want to sit on the, it's like the virtue of just being able to sit at the front of the bus versus right. us recognizing that, yes, these other image bearers that don't look like us, that don't share our ethnic image, they don't see us as equal, but I know that I'm created in the image of God and I have my inalienable rights given to me by God. I don't need your validation. I'm going to treat you with dignity and respect despite the fact that you don't see me as your equal and we're going to go over here with our Uber and make it do what it do. Like that, had I been in, I was like, wait a minute, hold on. I think we got a business here. I think we got a business. Let's do this. And in the spirit of Booker T, Booker T yes. was always talking about how do you make yourself useful to where despite the fact that you don't look like them, you're valuable. Like you said, when the plantation, when, when slavery ended, there were white slave owners like, we, we don't know how to cultivate this land. Like we have no skills. We need help. I would have been like, well, for the right price. Right. <laughs> I, can get this, I can get this land right for you, sir, yeah. <laughs> but it's going to cost you. Yes. You need my skill set, right? Yes. So, you know, that's just something I, I had to throw that in there because I'm, I know people as a black conservative, like, you know, always time out pulling up by your bootstrap. Well, what if you don't have no boots? Well, go find you some cow and make you some boots. You don't need the government for the leather. Don't right. shoot you an animal and make your own boots and then put some straps on them and pull them up. That, that's just how I think. But anyway. Let's move on to the problem of politics. So you also talk about, you know, there was some key, uh, key, key, legis not key legislation, some, some key Supreme Court rulings such as Brown versus uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Yep, and you yep. also talk about some of uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1957. And when we secured voting rights, you talk about the growing dependency on the federal government for legislative protections. And how the civil rights leaders kind of mobilized their workers to like, okay, well, now we got to get everybody to vote. What did right. we gain by that? But And what did we lose as a result of that? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it, it, it really, a lot of what took place next has a great deal to do with, uh, with Dr. King's philosophical positions. Um, you know, and we'll get into that in the 
next in the, in the next article. But what what he saw was one the the Republican Party had had given blacks you know the the Civil Rights Act of fifty seven uh, which helped which helped. Can you say that part again? Can you say, which party did that? I'm just, I'm just I just wanted to make sure people heard you. The Republican Party. Ah, yeah, you... okay. Just, just making sure it was clear. Just my, you know, I'm just saying. The, Repu the Republican Ooh. Party was was in place, and they they they, they were helpful uh, to to the degree that they they were providing civil rights acts, the Civil Rights Act of '57, they, 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 which which helped blacks. It was at it added protection for blacks to be able to vote. Um, right. Um, and and they, they uh, blacks were asking for. for for, uh, for uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower to do more, and and he did. He he went he went so far to do to, to try to you know to try to help and assist that his own constituency began to turn against him. Like you're, you're doing too much. You 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 need to slow down. You you you're you're, you're pu pushing things too fast. And so as as he had won the second election and was about to get out of office, but right by, right behind him was Nixon. Um, Nixon was there. He was the vice president. He's trying to figure out his his way into uh, the, the presidency, and and he was going up against up, up, up against Kennedy. Um, civil right, the civil rights movement changed, and and here's how it changed. You went from a bus boycott, which required us to be uh, uh, independent, right? Because now we had to figure out our own way to get somewhere. Right. To to something that was different, where we were doing sit-ins, right? Well, sit-ins don't require any self-sufficiency. Uh, sit-ins sit don't require you to, uh, to to figure out anything. All you're doing is you're going into a place, a place of business, uh, and sitting down, uh, waiting for them to say that they don't want to serve you, creating a ruckus for cameras to show up uh, and and people to capture that. So that it, I mean, this this is the first you know kind of social media uh, opportunity, right? Um, right. You were waiting for cameras to show up, and and even perhaps the hope would be uh, and that 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 dogs would show up, that that hoses would show up, that so, so that so that that could be captured and that it could be seen on television. And the whole reason why you wanted this was because you recognized King and others recognized that the whole of culture didn't feel the way that folks felt in the South about these issues, right? There was an absolute advantage to showing this on TV because it appealed to the hearts of those folks who were identifying already during this time with the idea of the Imago Dei, right? That all of us are bearers of God, that, that we'd all be treated equal. And so you, you were, you're trying to appeal to a larger audience who, 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 had, who had a soft spot for, for human beings, regardless of what color they were. So right. that, that, that was the shift. And when it took that shift, what, what was required then was for government to move in and do something different. Now, it wasn't a constitutional test that was in place. That's not what was in place. What it now required was you wanted legislation. And so government or politicians had to be willing to sign the right legislation. You hitched your wagon to whatever political party would advance your cause rather than self-sufficiency saying, if you, if you don't do it, that's fine. We got this covered. And ultimately, a constitutional test would be would ensue that would force the hand of, of you know, of, of whatever parties were trying to hold you back. That, that was the better route. But we took we took the we took the easier route. I, I say easier. And I don't mean I mean, folks were beaten. There were folks who lost their lives. All of that was at play. But it, in my estimation, some of that was needless uh, because it, it was it was a shift in tactics that actually created the environment where that began to happen. You know, I'll say this. If you think about who were the key players of those in those sit-ins at those lunch counters, these were young college-age students. I mean, 17, 18-year-olds. And I, I know how, how young and dumb I was when I was 18. And I, I would have hitched my wagon to anything. that I was like, yes, girl. I mean, it was just altruistic. And I'm feeling like, power to the people. Like, I don't even know what I'm co-signing to. I just want to be down for the cause. And when you think about it, we'll talk a little bit about the communistic Marxism and the socialistic influence on the uh, civil rights movement. But if you think about it, a lot of these young people, they really did not know the underpinnings of this movement. And like you said, the dogs and the hoses, while I appreciate their willingness to, to, to sacrifice and be arrested, if you really think about it, it's like, well, what were they really sacrificing and being arrested for based on what you just said? Kind of like, 
you know, you got the BLM riots. They really think that they are championing a righteous cause, but they really don't realize they're just being used as a tool to yes. advance another agenda. And I say this having knowing I know people who grew up in the segregated South and they're like, I I went to the March on Washington and I fought, you know, for civil rights. And it's hard to help them to compartmentalize and think through. Do you think you were used? Do you think you were a puppet? Like in your heart, you were there in good faith fighting for these rights, but was something else afoot that you were unaware of? And this is one reason why I think government uses the educational system. They use the school system and they use the intelligentsia in order to shape and frame a narrative so that young people think that they're in good faith fighting for A, but what they really do is ushering in B. What, what do you think about that? And like, how do we still extend grace to those who are like, I was beaten bloody for this cause. And it's like, but I, I empathize with you and I don't want anyone to have to suffer like that. But it's just like, maybe they naively didn't really know. What, what do you yeah. think? No, I, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think they really, they really knew most of those who were rolling with King were, were, were uneducated blacks who were just, hopeful they were they were you know um excited about a powerful orator uh, someone who was getting attention i mean everywhere you turn he was being interviewed on television and on radio and and in broadcasting in those days he was put forward as a as, as the charismatic leader of a movement and they whom they trusted you know um i i i believe that king as a gifted orator actually used the pulpit recognizing that the way to way to influence black people was was uh, to, to be in the pulpit, uh, to have the have the credential of a of you know of reverend, uh, that was helpful for him and it was needful for him. Uh, but you know, again, we'll, we'll talk about it in a bit. He he absolutely. I mean, was. might as well go on and go. Okay, so <laughs> our, our 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 Booker T. Booker T. It, he has a quote where he actually talks about the preacher and how. So basically, y'all, what Virgil is basically saying is that you know. Kind of like how I'm always calling Jamal Bryant and, and Raphael Warnock a sleeper cell, right? Yeah. How they really represent something else. Um, well before any of either of them were born, Booker T had something to say about the preacher. I'm trying to find this quote. I can't remember which article it's in. In the second it one. Is, uh, it's in the, what, the MLK one? Yes. Okay. Because I had it highlighted. I'm just trying to remember where I put it. Booker T. Washington, I'm going to find this quote. Y'all just going to have to sit back and be patient and wait because this quote is super important and I want to, ah, I got it. Found so it. in Up From Slavery, which I'm going to link that too. Y'all need to get that book. That book changed my life. Mm -hmm. Booker T. Washington wrote, the ministry was the profession that suffered most and still suffers, though there has been great improvement on account of not only ignorant but in many cases, immoral men who claimed that they were called to preach. In the earlier days of freedom, almost every colored man who learned how to read would receive a call to preach within a few days after he began reading. Yeah. So to explain why is this quote so important and how does it relate to what you just said about MLK. I mean, we're going to talk more about MLK. I just want to finish talking about civil rights, but I, I just didn't want to let that opportunity. Pass. Yeah, no, he, he, if, if, if you read, if you read the book, he actually lays out in, in, in up from slavery, a, a very clear picture of what begins to happen. You got black folks who've been breaking their backs on the, on the land, right? They've been working and toiling and, 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 and striving and, you know, hardworking, sweat, hot, all of that. So what would end up happening in, in the black church, you know, Folks would show up, and it was a hilarious little section of his book where folks would show up to church on Sunday. You know, they would they would they would, they would get excited, catch the Holy Ghost, and fall out. Uh, they would come back to church next Sunday, catch the Holy Ghost, and fall out. And then by the third Sunday, they would catch the Holy Ghost and fall out. And then they'd get up and they'd be like, "You know what? I I think I was called to preach." And uh, most of them, <laughs> most most of them had just learned to read. You know. Yeah. Had had no had no real ability to uh, to really exegete the text of scripture. Didn't really understand what what scripture meant. But in the you know it, it, the thought was well it'll get me out of having to work hard that hard labor that backbreaking labor. Uh, I can be in front of people and lead some folk. 
And so yeah, but one of the of prominence in the community, you can't forget that part. The, the, the pastor, the preacher has always been held in high esteem within yeah. a black American culture. Why? Because one, he probably was the only one that could read. Um, if we just want to be honest. And then two, it was just something about that place of authority. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was a very appealing and we see the same thing today. Jamal Bryan is on record saying that he was never, you know, called the preach. He kind of just stumbled upon it, but he, what he really wanted to do was lead the NAACP. And I'm always saying, can y'all please come get him, please. <laughs> some, somebody give him a job. I'll fix the resume and right. formulate it. However, ever it needs to work for y'all organization, get that man a job. And get right. Him out of it. right, right. But this was this was important, I think, to note because of kind of the tradition of, of the black church. The, the third article that I'm going to write is all about the black church. And so uh, this this was an article. This was a, a quote that I that I ran across. I thought about it. And as I began to examine King's life, uh, you know, and, and again, knowing his background, what he believed from a from a, you know, a theologically speaking, um, it, it became evident that uh, as a gifted orator, the best place for him to advance his cause uh, was was in the pulpit. Uh, it had little to do with uh, his affection for Christ or, um, you know, or, or any belief that he had that Jesus was Lord or I mean, any of those things. He, he did not believe those things. He was actually very clear about his disbelief and disregard for those kinds of things. And so, um, you know, he I think he used the pulpit and, and as a result. Um, had an idea, an ideology, a framework, the, the, a Marxian framework. In, in a lot of cases, those who were closest to him uh, were actually about communists um, and, and who were who, the folks. In fact, the folks who helped him, who helped him write the I Have a Dream speech, uh, you know, they, they had they, they had commu a, a communist background. I know as soon as you say those kinds of things, people begin to turn you off. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why I really refrain asserting that into much of the article. I really didn't want to put that in the article because I wanted people, even to, even apart from that, to see kind of some some of the some of the missteps of the civil rights movement uh, and the background of King uh, that that should cause every one of us to pause and think for a minute. Uh, so I didn't really I didn't really spend a lot of time on the on the socialistic aspects or the communistic connections. Right. I, I think the struggle that we're going to even experience on this live stream today, and this is why I even want to say it, because I know there are people in the generation before me who were in their early 20s in 1963 or 1957, including my mom, that when you try to broach this conversation, you know, now my mama, you know, she loves me. So if I bring some information to her, I'm one of those kids like, listen, you just you need to abandon what you thought you knew because this right here, you need to know this. And I'm just pushy like that. I'm like, I'm going and you're going to get this truth. But then there are others <laughs> in the generation X. It's like, well, you can't just tell mama that because she's not going to hear. It. And I'm just like, if we love people, we should want to relish in the truth and not see them just be like, well, they just going to believe what they want to believe. Like, no, I think we can lovingly broach these conversations because I, I saw it on social media this week. Where what surprised me was that a very prominent black conservative that I respect was very upset when another friend of mine on social media was just dropping truth bombs about MLK. It was just like, we we don't want to hear that. And I was like, well, wait a minute now. You of old people do not strike me as one that would put your head in the sand about truth. But it was almost like celebrate the accomplishment. But let's not talk about all that other stuff. And I'm like, we can do both. And I think we can celebrate the accomplishments. But as Christians, now, you just want, if you're a secular humanist and you just like MLK is my idol and that's where I'm going to leave them, fine. But if you're a believer, you need to understand the framework that was shaped around the civil rights movement and the Trojan horse that was really a foot there. And then you also need to understand the theological implications and why. If we're going to deal in truth, we got to at least be like, OK, something else was going on here because this man was in somebody's pulpit, but he didn't even believe in the resurrection or the deity of Christ. Like that is scary because he captured the hearts and minds of so many uh, people and members of the black church. Mm -hmm. And when you bring these things up, so let, let's just go ahead and talk about it. We're not yeah. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time because this is like I said, this is not a character attack. I don't care. Mm -hmm about his adulterous dealings. That was him and his wife's problem. And it was sinful and it was wicked. And she didn't seem to have a problem with it that we know of. So I'm not even going to go there, right? Because we that's not the issue. My issues are theological. 
if we're going to have this discussion, how do we present this information in such a way so that Christians understand this is what the Christian faith hinged upon? And if you have someone that's posing as a preacher of the gospel, but they don't believe these things, what do we do with them? Because they don't have any issue doing this with Warnock. They know where he stands. And they're like, nah, he's not a real preacher. But it's something about MLK when Warnock is literally just following in the steps of MLK and they both have the same heretical doctrine. Why right. can't we put them in the same box? At least King accomplished something that everybody could benefit from, which was, you know, the desegregation and the, some aspects of the civil rights movement. But why can't we talk about this? No, well, I think I think the biggest reason is because um, we, we've deified King. I mean, two things have taken place. One is a, a revisionist historical perspective, right? We've we've, okay. we've 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 ignored history because even even in King's day, King 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 had his detractors, right? Folks, there were a lot of folks who didn't like King. Uh, there were folks who thought he was an agitator. You had on 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 his left, you had th folks who thought he was an agitator, needed to sit down, needed to be quiet, needed to shut up, and 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 most of those people <clears throat> were church going folk who were serious. Right about the word who who didn't didn't have a desire to try to integrate anything all they wanted to do was to be left alone they really just wanted to be left alone mm -hmm. and then you had the people to, to to the right of king like like the malcolm x's of the world who felt like he wasn't he wasn't doing enough you know he, he didn't say enough he wasn't saying things strongly enough so he, he had his detractors on both, both sides it's only in light of uh you know in, in light of the fact that you know he's a, a slain civil rights leader uh, that that everyone has decided there's no real clarity that we could have about what about what he said or about what was said, uh, and so that's that's kind right. of the that that's kind of I think that's kind of what takes place. But one of the key things that 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 struck me that I didn't even know about at the time I I, I knew that the 1960s saw a shift from for black folks in particular from Republican the Republican Party to the Democratic Party, and I did not uh, April I did not know why. Until right. I did, until I did this piece, and once I did the uh, piece, share, share, okay, share yeah. with us because someone even asked that, like, where is this narrative coming from that the party switched? Like, what what is all of that about? So, give us some insight. No, it was a, it was a, it was a presidential election in 1960, and what was happening was you had you, you had um, uh, uh, oh gosh, uh, uh, the uh, the president Nixon. You had you had Vice President uh, Nixon. Who was uh, was going up against uh, uh, John F. Kennedy? The election was close. Um, King and and the folks there were were trying were were traveling through the South, dealing with these sit-ins, and 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 wicked policemen would pull them out. They, they would see civil rights leaders come to their city, and they would pull them over for anything. You know, they they right. knew if they knew King was coming, they would pull them over. They give him a ticket. Well, he had so many of these tickets. He just ignored them. King just ignored those tickets, right? Well, he shows back up in in Atlanta of all places, and uh, and and is doing a, a doing a sit in. As soon as he leaves the sit in, the police capture him and and say, "Oh, you got you got a ticket that hadn't been paid. We're gonna throw you in jail." Well, in mm -hmm. in, in Atlanta at the time, this was chain gang uh, territory. That he was gonna he was gonna do some hard time here. And uh, his wife, uh, Coretta, who was six months pregnant, she didn't know what to do. Well, she knew that there was that they, that they had curried favor on the Republican side of the ticket. So they had had someone reach out to Vice President Nixon and Nixon was trying to run for the presidency. This was a close election. And his and Nixon was like, look, y'all are stirring up too much trouble. I, I, I don't I do not have time right now to deal with this. Well, someone placed a call to Kennedy and Kennedy said, hey, listen, I've got a brother. Uh, Robert, who uh, who understands what's going on uh, with with the uh, with the police department down there, he's going to make a call, and uh, you know, and he he talked to he uh, he talked to Coretta, he talked to Coretta, uh, and told Coretta, listen, I I'm going to take care of it. You don't worry about it. We'll get it taken care of. So Robert Kennedy makes a call, gets King out of jail. King shows up at home with Coretta. Now. King Sr. had a massive following in the black community. He had been a pastor for a very long time. And he had never uh, uh, advocated or went out and said, I endorse this particular person. Now, what he had done in this election cycle was he, had, he, had, uh, he, was, he was actually against Kennedy. And the reason was because Kennedy was Catholic. 
He didn't want a Catholic in there. It was a big bugaboo about him being a man Catholic, that he really wasn't Christian. And, you know, what, what's he going to do when he gets in there? Well, once, once Kennedy is responsible for letting his son out of jail, King Sr. gets on as soon as he can run to a pulpit and a microphone and some cameras and says, I have to give credit where credit is due. It was John F. Kennedy. And now this is October going into a November election, right? He tells everybody, look, it was, it was Kennedy who helped us out. Kennedy is the man. You know, I appreciate him. And then, and then King does the exact same thing. Now, this election is tight. It's really tight. However, because of that, those two endorsements in the Black community where they got on television and pushed that narrative that, 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 uh, that, that, King, that, that uh, Kennedy was the man, they got, they, Kennedy received 70% of, of the Black vote. 70%. When Blacks had previously voted Republican. Right. Historically. He gets 70% of the black vote, and it is the margin by which he wins like a 3%. You go back and look at the numbers, it's like 3% of, of the victory he, he wins and then wins the presidency. And so once he wins the presidency and all the blacks follow him, they feel like they were the ones who elected right. a president. So he Kennedy was their president. Kennedy was the first, in their minds, was the first black president, right? <laughs> so, 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 then, so then what happens? Kennedy gets shot, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and black folk felt like we were the ones who got shot. Yeah. Right. right. And, and from that point on, from that point on, from, from the point at which Kennedy, we have forever stayed on the democratic plantation forever. Now there, there was a time period in the, in the late thirties where this happened as well with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but it was 30. And then we went right back to the Republican party. And during, during the Depression, we went right back to the Republican Party, and then it was again in 60. And from the 60s, we have stayed on the Democratic plantation ever since, you know, voting up upwards of 80 to 90 percent of us voting for the Democratic platform. Right. OK, so the issue, I don't know if some people are coming in late. Um, the very thing I said was going to happen is happening where people are like, oh, wait a minute now. The accomplishments of King, we can't take that away from him. Where would we be without him? So. In case you're just joining us, we already kind of address um, the tension that we're going to experience in this conversation. This is not a personal attack, but the, the title of the show, the whole podcast is The Standard of Truth, right? So that means that we don't, we shed light on things that are true and we examine them making proper distinctions and, and, and we just want to be people of the light and we want to know. Now, what you choose to do with this information is up to you. We've already talked about the strides that the civil rights movement gained in terms of desegregation, but we haven't gotten to, we haven't started the conversation yet about how it failed the black community. We talked a little bit about it when we talked about how doing the Montgomery bus boycott, yes, we won after that boycott, buses are now desegregated, but we lost because we missed an opportunity where all of that money that we filtered or funneled from the city of Montgomery, uh, was it Birmingham or Montgomery? I was Montgomery. Montgomery. How we filtered that money from Montgomery into our own, you know, Uber program. And then once the boycott was over, we were like, okay, well, we just want to go sit on the front of the bus now. And we missed out on all of that economic opportunity that we created from scratch for ourselves, just being innovative and recognizing that we either find a way or make a way, but what you're not going to do is make us feel less than or inferior just because we can't sit on your bus. And that's what we talked about. We talked about how the civil roots, civil rights movement actually forced us to become more dependent on government and looking to politicians to help us win the power to be better and do better. We've always had it. Um, so th that's the nature of the conversation. I just wanted to bring that um, up. And I also want to acknowledge a super chat from Willie Doc. Willie Doc uh, was just thanking us for this show. Um, keep rocking the bow tie. And he appreciates us tackling the sacred cow and subjects and centering on Christ. That for me, that's what it's all about. I tell you guys, you know, regardless of how I vote, my loyalty is to Christ alone. And I recognize I'm just a sojourner passing through. This world is not my home. But while I'm here, 
I will participate in the political process because I I don't I, I want to live in peace and yeah. quiet and yeah. I want I do want them to leave me alone though. So if that means I got to get involved to make that happen, um, I'm, I'm definitely going to do that. So let's continue in talking about, we talked about some of the strides that the civil rights movement made, but how it hasn't really, um, it it has, there has been some failure in terms of the outcomes. What I want to do now, I'm going to read two quotes just so people understand the theological framework and 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 why Dr. King may have been a great social activist, but there were some theological issues that pretty much were the foundation as to why what we see now is the modern civil rights movement. We see the roots of where it came from. So let me let me read this. King wrote, where is it? Um As it pertains to the bodily resurrection, he goes, this doctrine, the resurrection upon which the Easter faith rests, symbolizes the ultimate Christian conviction that Christ conquered death. From a literary, historical, and philosophical point of view, this doctrine raises many questions. He then goes, in fact, the external evidence for the authenticity of this doctrine is found wanting. I'm sorry, preachers of the gospel who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and who've been justified by grace through faith don't say stuff like this. He's literally saying, you know, I don't really see like the hour evidence for the resurrection. And it's just the facts are just not there. Um, And he also did not believe in the deity of Christ. And so the, the rejection of the doctrine of the virgin birth and the second coming of Christ and a, a literal hell leads me to why I keep saying Jamal Bryant and Raphael Warnock are MLK 2.0. They're just not as charismatic, and but they are equally influential, but equally bad for the Black community because they have the same theological issues. Now, Jamal Bryant may not go on record questioning the resurrection, but he does other things that He's def- he definitely has the social justice activism going on in the spirit of MLK, and so does Warnock. Warnock probably mirrors King's theology. We, we don't know what Jamal Bryant believes theologically because his social activism kind of clouds his gospel preaching that's completely absent. But there were so few of his Orthodox Christian faith that people are still trying to figure out, how, how did this guy become a preacher in the Black church? What are your thoughts on that? Well, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's difficult to think that someone who's called preacher or pastor or in any way would deny Christ. And um, one of the things I try to do in this article, because I, 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 you know, people, one, a lot of folks don't don't know this about King. Uh, those who do know bits and pieces. So in one article, I wanted to I wanted to lay out all of King's the, you know theological ideas. Uh, from what he believed about the deity of Christ, which he actually denied. He actually used two words to describe it. He says that the doctrine was harmful and detrimental. So, so the doctrine of the deity of Christ, he believes is are harmful and detrimental. You know, it's harmful and detrimental. And so, um, yeah, I don't know any preacher that, that, that says that or believes that. And, and, and scripture is clear that, that, you know, if you, if you deny Christ, then you know, there, there, there's nothing. There's no hope for you, uh, and that's where that's where King was. Um, I, 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 in addition to that, I linked King's own writing the article so that people wouldn't that they don't have to trust what I've said um, about it. They can go look at his writing themselves. So they can go to the original source documents and see all that. Even even the issues of the virgin birth, the second coming, and a literal hell. You can click on those links and go read the entirety of his article so that you can judge for yourself whether I've taken his thoughts and ideas out of context, you know, right. or, you know, or, or, or something along those lines. I, I promise you I hadn't. And not only that, but there, there are sermons that I didn't attach to this where he would go to a place and preach uh, and make statements like, well, it doesn't really matter what you think about the deity of Christ or it really doesn't matter what you think about the bodily resurrection. He was literally pre- preaching to an audience and would say, though, no, no pastor I know is going to say it doesn't really matter what you think about. 
and then say something about Christ or something about the resurrection. But, but he did on, on numerous occasions, and we have those things on record. So th this is not uh, this is not hearsay. This is not, well, I think he might have felt this way. This is exactly what he believed. And uh, again, you can't call him you can't call him pastor. I don't believe he was a Christian. Uh, at the at the end of the day, you know, he 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 I, like I said, I believe that he used uh, the pulpit as a as a means to advance an agenda. <clears throat> he did have a gospel. Uh, his gospel was not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was the gospel of of, of Walter Rauschenbusch, uh, and yes. Walter Rausch Walter Rauschenbusch actually advanced what's known as the social gospel. If you go look him up. Uh, Rauschenbusch is spelled R-A-U-S-C-H-E-N-B-U-S-C-H. Uh, you can look him up and, and find that he was he was the uh, father of the of the social gospel uh, earlier in, in the century, 1910, 1920. He was a pastor in Hell's Kitchen, New York, um, and he watched he watched immigrants flood into uh, you know the, uh, the the New York Harbor, uh, and and each Im with each immigrant class. They got treated like much like blacks did in the South, right? They were the outcast, and so in in, in great and good, humble, um, kind-hearted uh, Christian love, he wanted to do something. Uh, the problem was over time he began to 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 mix this transformative cultural message to uh, it, it needed to be the gospel. So the gospel was no longer salvation, uh, transformation from the inside out. It was social transformation from the outside in. And uh, he, he would eventually make statements like if, if, if the gospel is just about saving sinners um, and, and not about, about ransoming society, uh, it was no gospel at all. Uh, he, right. would eventually, he would eventually be deemed by his, by his denomination as, as a heretic. Uh, and, uh, and and was and was really cast out. But 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 this is the gospel that King planned on preaching. This was the place that he. This was this was those were the ideas that he wanted to advance. Right. Yeah. I I see a little bit of the cognitive dissonance kind of showing up in the comments. Um, like I said, I knew this was going to be a very an emotionally taxing topic because people are like, you you leave Dr. King alone because. What I find is when you present information, regardless of who it is on what it is. People have to now you force them to have to do something about it. Right. And for some people, they're just like, I don't really want to have to do something like when you give me this information. Now I have to do something. I have to make a choice if I'm just going to act like I don't see it and hold on to my deeply held presupposition. Or I'm going to be like, you know what? This was hard to hear but I'm going to challenge myself to listen to it anyway, because what I think I may have believed may not have been the truth. And so I would encourage um, CW here on, I mean, you seem kind of really upset and emotionally engaged that we're actually even bringing up, um, you know, MLK's name, but as a Christian, we, we deal with the truth. And so no one is taking away the advancements that were made with the civil rights movement, nor are we using this as an opportunity to disparage his character. These are theological concerns that should be a problem for every blood-bought believer. Now, you can stay in your feelings, right? Or you can say, wait a minute, Christ died for my sins in accordance with the scriptures, and if I'm holding in high esteem someone that believed in opposition to that, I need to make a decision is it Christ over everything or is Christ over everything except when it comes to MLK? Like I challenge you to have that same conversation with yourself. You don't have to have that conversation with us. Right. Um, but what you cannot do is try to silence the opposition just because you just don't like what we're saying. What we're trying to do is encourage um, objective thinking on the basis of objective truth. And I find people don't want to do that. Um, right. Let me read this quote. Let us continue to hope, work, and pray that in the future we will live to see a warless world, a better distribution of wealth, and a brotherhood that transcends color or race. This is the gospel that I will preach to the world. So this is a quote in a letter that Dr. King wrote to his wife explaining the gospel that he intended to preach. And what stood out to me um, it wasn't as in the world, the warless world, because I'm like, you know, peace on earth, goodwill to man. I get that. No, no one likes unnecessary war, but there's there's an undertone to that that we don't have to discuss. But when he said a better distribution of wealth, I was like, that, that sounds a little socialistic and 
that's some Marxism sounding. I was like, I don't, that bothers me. Um, as a constitutional conservative and a capitalist, knowing that capitalism is the mainstay, it is the best economic system that pulls people out of poverty when they know what to do with it. I was like, a better distribution of wealth. I was like, no, nah, I, I don't. I don't like that. And I don't know if there's a gospel that promotes that, but it's not the gospel of Christ. And then a brotherhood that transcends race or color. I'm like, okay, well, the gospel of Christ does that. It unites us all um, from every tribe, tongue, nation. You know, the, the book of Acts tells us that. But he, he described that as a gospel that he would preach to the world. But there was no mention of Christ and him crucified and being justified by faith through grace. That, that troubled me. A lot because I said, well, he's supposed to be a Christian. Why is he not bringing up Jesus or the need, our, our, the problem with the world being sin and then our need for Christ? It was really the agenda was something else. And it was just done under the guise of him just being a black Baptist pastor. Would, would you yeah. agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. What 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 happened there is. When when you when when you have a, a theological framework that does not have a right view of God, what then happens is you have a a terrible view and understanding of the world. Right, his view of the world was was this idea that men are inherently good, or that there's some good that can happen in the hearts of men to the degree that that we could actually have a warless world. Right, uh, if he had read his Bible, he would read things like there are going to be wars and rumors of wars. Right, that 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 men, that men are inherently evil and wicked and and desire power. And if he understood the world in which we live understood the God who created it, he would have a biblical framework to understand that there was no way to have a warless world apart from Christ's return. But of course, right. he didn't believe in a resurrection. So he, there would be no way for him to think about the return of Christ. Um, the, the, the redistribution of wealth, that's a, that's a socialistic point of view. Absolutely. A, a brotherhood that transcends race or color. The only brotherhood is found in Christ Jesus and him crucified based upon the gospel and, and the finished work of Christ. Well, if you don't have a, if you don't, if Christ, if Christ wasn't born of a virgin, if, if he, if he never died a, a death to, to pay for our sin and, and, and rise from the dead to, to show that that debt was paid for, there's no hope that we have. Now, what he does is he begins to elevate himself to the degree that he's going to be about bringing that good news, this, this, this utopian world that he's created in his mind. He's going to be able to bring that to the world on the strength of, of, of his oratory power, of his connections with political government, of, of the people that he can rally to his to his cause. And so this is a this is a very backwards view uh, of, of, of what you know what King wanted to do. Are you are you prepared to give any thoughts or commentary on the communistic influence and money that was given to MLK to fund this cause as well? And I just discovered this myself. I was watching a documentary called Anarchy. And it talked about how the Communist Party was actually funding MLK and the reason why we see so much of the socialism and the Marxism and the communist ideals is because this is where a lot of the money to fund the movement was coming from. But before, before you answer that, we know that there was an ecumenical influence on a lot of King's ideas. We know right. that it was the Hindu religion of Mahatma Gandhi and then the Buddhist monk. I don't even know how to say his name, so I'm not even going to try. But then this guy, Walter Roshan, is it Roshan Roshan Bush. Yes. Yep. Roshan yep. Yep. Bush is where he got a lot of his ideas from. But we need to segue into we can celebrate the gains that we received through the civil rights movement, but we need to talk about what else did we hitch our wagon to, right? What else did we gain? What was the Trojan horse? What do we see in this modern social justice, civil rights 2.0? What are the other things that hitched themselves to this movement that no one else made the connection, but it was right there hiding in plain sight? Like, for example, in your the other article, the one that you did, before the MLK article, you talked about, no, 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 no. It was in the MLK article. It was in the MLK article. Wait, was it in the MLK article? Yes. You talked about how the civil rights movement worked, all of the constitutional amendments, but how it also 
paved the way instead of equality and civil rights organizations contributing to the ongoing effort to achieve equity and outcomes for minorities. We're battling all these other things today, such as the Black Lives Matter movement, the rights of the LGBTQIA community. Um, the, we're, talk to us about all of the other isms or rights that mirrored or hitched themselves to the civil rights movement and why, at the end of the day, why you've come to the conclusion that the civil rights movement did not it really wasn't as good as we think it was for the black community. I know that was yeah, a really loaded question. I, I, yeah, I, th I think I think we got to start with. I, I think it's a presupposition that the civil rights movement was of great benefit. Right. So I, 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 you have to start there, and and I've started doing that because, like you said, online folks are just you know jumping mad about these articles and they're going off. And so the question that I ask is, in a sentence. Explain what was beneficial about civil rights or about the, mm -hmm. about the civil rights movement. And, 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 and I haven't really had many people respond. Like, um, the outside of the right to vote and the desegregation. Yeah, we, we had, we had, we had the right to vote. Um, we, we, we already, I mean, we, we, we already did. If you go back to the, if you go back to the, <laughs> to the previous article, uh, I kind of laid out what, what it took for us to, uh, you had the American Civil War. You had the Emancipation Proclamation. You had the Thirteenth Amendment, which ended slavery. You had the Fourteenth Amendment, which gave citizen gave gave us the same rights as all citizens. You had the Fifteenth Amendment, which gave men the right to vote. Now, you you did have Jim Crow laws and peonage uh, black codes, and you had these things that were barriers, right? But what they required was a test of the Constitution. Um, Anytime the Constitution was tested, which happened at the Montgomery bus boycott, the Constitution validated the fact that we were citizens who needed to be given equal rights, right? So you didn't gain anything from this civil rights movement that you didn't already have. Um, Can you say that part again? Because I'm... <laughs> I'm struggling. Like normally I wouldn't, and I don't want to call CW a troll. I think I have an idea of who CW is, but I'm not sure. And I don't want to make an assumption. But the reason why I'm belaboring this point is because this show was specifically for people like CW. And I, I'm not trying to call you out personally, but I do want to speak to you specifically because I think I know who you are. And I think I saw the struggle that you even had for you. You don't even understand why we need to discuss this. And right. you're so hell bent on just saying, stop talking about it, that you're missing the forest from the trees. This brother just articulated that within the confines of the Constitution that already governed the, the, this country as we know it, we technically did. The question was, what did we gain from the civil rights movement that we didn't already have or there was already not a provision that just needed to be, would you say, substantiated? But yeah. for example, with abortion, babies have always been protected. Life in the womb, all, it's, it's never been a constitutional right for us to murder babies. Right. It's just not there at all. Roe v. Wade was a Supreme Court case that needed to be overturned because it was unconstitutional from the beginning, just like it was unconstitutional for us to not be tr treated as image bearers and be treated equal. Is that a fair argument that I'm making? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. I mean, so listen to the argument, get out your feelings. Like, let's just grow up. Because if I'm not mistaken, if you are who I think you are, you're well over 60. Now, if, you're, if that's not you, I apologize. And I repent for thinking you were somebody else. But based on your initials, I think I, I respect if, if you are who, who I think you are, I respect you greatly, but I'm confused that you were really struggling this hard. Um, and it might be a generational thing. I don't know. And so I want to defer respect to you in that manner, but I really need you to calm down and, and, and let's think methodically about this. And I don't know how many times we have to say this is not a character assassination. We don't get the right to just push inconvenient truths under the rug because we don't like how they feel. Like if I found out my father was a, a, a habitual wife beater. Yes, I love my father, but I'd be like, wait a minute, daddy, you was out here beating my mama? Like, that's just wrong. Like, I got to deal with the truth. But like I said, when you present this kind of information and people realize they, wait a minute, I got to do something about it, you may not have been ready. 
But I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. And we're going to continue to shed light. But if this is team too much for you, maybe you should come back when you've had an opportunity to read the articles and kind of get this all reconciled within yourself. What do, what do you say about that? Absolutely. I mean, that that's, again, one of the reasons for writing articles like this is for the purpose of, of you know, Chrono, you know, having having not, not, not only a, a, a chronological approach, a logical approach, uh, a thoughtful approach, but it's so that people can, like you said, get out of their feelings, read the material, and every single thing that I'm saying, I backed up with links so that you can go look at the original source documents to validate or invalidate the conclusions that I come to. So this is not for me. It's not. It. It. it there's. There's really no need to get in your feelings uh, because all the information is there and you can assess it and say, hey, he, he's right because this is exactly what this says uh, or I don't appreciate the conclusion and I have a different thought process. And either way, I'm good. Either way, I'm good because at least you've examined, you've examined what's been said. Right. Well, so let's go back to talking about, we talked about the other things that has have hitched themselves to the civil rights movement and how you don't get one without the other stuff because the other stuff was already built into the foundation. We just didn't know it. You right. Know, do you know what I'm talking about? Absolutely. Yeah. If, if you, if you kind of, the, the article that, that I wrote about King, I actually started the article from a very odd place. If you think about it. It was uh, odd. I was like, like, where is he going with this? Yeah. I actually start, I actually started with the Obergefell decision. And and it and it doesn't. It, it, I mean, it, if you're not if, if you're not tracking with where I'm going, it's like we gonna talk about King, and you're gonna bring up you know gay marriage. Like, how does that even co compute? Like, where do you? I come was up with so that? confused, and that's why I was like, let me find out where my brother's going because this, right. this is wild. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Right. Well, the re the reason why I did that was because I wanted to show up front that the Obergefell decision, that same sex marriage, the LGBTQIA agenda, trans rights, all of that. This is the new civil rights, and, and this is where we are. This is a part of King's legacy. I also wanted to show you that initially the argumentation around same-sex marriage was all related to, quote-unquote, equal rights, right? Ah. It was connected to equal rights. The thought was all we want as, as same-sex marriage couples or, or same-sex couples, we want equal rights. Well, really, the reality was they weren't arguing for equal rights. Because everyone had the equal right to marry someone of the opposite sex. What they were arguing for were special rights. That's, That's what they were arguing. Yeah, they, they wanted to attach the definition of marriage to whatever they determined they wanted to do with, with their unions. And so they were arguing for, and so I'm, what I'm showing you up front, and, and again, I, I use a quote by Clarence Thomas, uh, and this is an important quote because it, it is exactly the mold that the civil rights movement takes. He says this about the Obergefell decision, the same sex marriage decision. And I want you to think about this because what we've been talking about is constitutional rights and civil rights. There's a difference between the two. So here's what Clarence Thomas says. He says this quote, since well before 1787, liberty has been understood as freedom from government action, not entitlement to government benefits. Now here he's talking about the issue of same-sex marriage, but, but he, he flips the page and shows you what the framers actually determined. He said, the framers created our constitution to preserve the understanding of liberty, right? Yet the majority, the majority and by what he means by the majority is the, the people who won the Obergefell decision. The majority invokes our constitution in, in the name of a liberty that the framers would not have recognized to the detriment of the liberty they sought to protect. Mm -hmm. This is the, this is the key sentence. I don't Along think people are getting what you're putting down. <laughs> you might no no no. I'm not, you know the reason why I say that social media has dumbed us down to when a sentence is really wordy, people lose the sentiment, yeah. and you literally have to exegete basic sentences. If you don't mind, can you do that for us, please? Absolutely, absolutely. What 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 is happening in this in this second sentence where he says the framers created our constitution to preserve our understanding of liberty? He is about to define liberty. He's about to define what it means for us to be free. He's about to he's about to unpack from where we get our freedoms from. 
the majority, in other words, those who want same-sex marriage, are appealing to government for the purpose of validating marriage for them. Mm. And what Justice Thomas is saying is, listen, if what you are, if what you're advocating were really from God, you would need validation from government. Because the way the framers set all of this up, your dignity does not come from government. Come your, on, dig bro. your dignity comes from God. And so that's the argument that he's framing in this in this in this lengthy quote. He he at the last sentence says, along the way, it rejects the idea captured in our Declaration of Independence that human dignity is an innate and suggests instead that it comes from government. So what they're saying is we need marriage to be validated by the government so that we can feel you know, uh, appreciated, so that we can feel like we're equal. And what right. the framers wanted to do was the framers wanted to give you freedom that is innate, uh, liberty that is innate, validation that is innate, and they wanted to remove government from having to do just that. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. We've just been accused of thinking we're white. <laughs> <laughs> You're so cute. I don't think he is. He's not who I think he is in. He wouldn't. The person I'm thinking of probably wouldn't have said something so stupid. I'm not going to give funny. you any more attention, CW. It's been fun. It's been real fun. But that that was special. That's funny. Well, the, the reason why I laid that out is then I begin to show you that all of those who follow King those who marched with King began mm. validating LGBTQIA plus rights. Okay, you're going to have to break that down because here it okay. says it goes without saying that King's legacy would encompass the entire LGBTQIA affirming and transhuman agenda and that he and other civil rights leader have paved the way for more significant victory. So specifically, you talk about um, John Lewis, Jesse Jackson, um, Andrew, Andrew, was Young. Andrew Young, and I, I need to specifically get into. Gosh, which article was that? Was that the first one or the it's, second it's one? It's the second one. Okay, because you specifically named. You had some quotes in here yeah, that fifth I wanted to fifth paragraph in. Huh? Fifth paragraph in. Well, I printed out. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, uh, sis. How I kind of printed it out, and my. I feel like I'm missing a page. I, I, don't, I don't like this. It feels like, because you talked about, um, there were some quotes I wanted to read and I don't see it. I don't, I don't see my quotes. Where did they go? It was a John oh. Lewis quote. There was a John, right, Lewis. John Lewis quote. Mm -hmm. And it was um, how Andrew, uh, Andrew Young, who I met in person. I have a picture with him, by the way. Yep, he was, um, he was the mayor of Atlanta at one time. Yeah, I'm I'm missing that page. Yeah. I missed the page. I'm gonna pull it up from yep. the uh the actual the digital website. copy yeah. of the article because it's it's too important to miss. So uh here you had here it is, I found it in 1985. So y'all, this is not recent. This this foundation and connection between the, the original civil rights movement and where we are today, it, it runs deep. In 1985, Andrew Young, who marched with Dr. King, proclaimed Atlanta's first Pride Week. So he was the one that was just like, yes, it's like Pride Week, right? In numerous interviews, Reverend Jesse Jackson likened the fight for same-sex marriage as equivalent to the battle for civil rights. I bet you didn't know that. Then Congressman John Lewis, who fought alongside King was an early proponent of same-sex marriage. In a Boston Globe editorial, Lewis wrote, I've heard the reasons for opposing civil marriage for same-sex couples cut through the distractions and they stink of the same fear, hatred, and intolerance I have known in racism and bigotry. When I read that, I was like, wait, say what now? So I, I, what I think happened this happened in plain sight and none of us were paying attention. I think if blood-bought believers, Bible-believing Christians actually knew this, they would have said something sooner. Would you, do? You, were we just asleep? Like, how, how did this get hitched to our wagon without us realizing it? Yeah, I, I, I don't, you know, it, it's interesting. I think a lot of it has to do 
um, with the with the ideas that King pushed forward from equality to equity of outcome. And and okay. this was this was just the similar similar fight. There's a, a guy uh, who is a historian of LGBTQ politics. His name is Eric Cervini. Uh, and, and just above it, he 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 writes uh, the idea that every single uh, uh, element of what they know as, as gay rights or pride uh, actually came from the Black Freedom Movement. And so I, I wanted to show that, that there was a straight line from King to the folks who marched with King right into the new civil rights movement. And so, I, I, you know, they, none of them balked, none of them pushed back uh, against this. One of the things I didn't put in the, in the piece is is uh, a guy by the name I'm looking up the, the name the guy's name is Baird Rustin. You got are oh. you familiar with you familiar with Baird? Yes, he was a sodomite. He was he was a sodomite uh, <laughs> who who helped to craft the I Have a Dream speech. And he was a communist. And he was a communist who who worked alongside King and and was and he was known at the time to be gay. Uh, he, he was, was arrested for what? Um, inappropriate, in a, right? Like he was like, and y'all, this was in what the sixties? Sixties, the fifties, sixties no. over on the west coast. Yes, he was. He was. He was arrested. He was in a. He was in a car with two men doing what they do, and uh, got arrested. And all of this was in plain sight. So King King had these folks right with him. And in fact, there's a, there's an image of Baird right behind King during the, I have a dream speech. So you, you've got these men who are writing this stuff close to King connected to King. So for us to think that, that the idea that the LGBTQI plus agenda would be foreign to King or that he wouldn't promote it. Coretta Scott King was, was one of the advocates for LGBTQI rights. I mean, you could all of this stuff is stuff you can go validate, identify, and know for yourself. So you you have to be uh, purposefully, willfully ignorant uh, about these things to 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 not know a that they're happening or or b that 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 this that that the that the place where I landed was a plausible place based upon the history. Here's the deal. I remember in elementary school during Black History Month, we learned there was this song and we, I called it the civil rights song. I don't know the name of it, but it basically we went through all of the civil rights movements so we could learn their name. Bayard, Rustin, Julian Bond. Uh, the, I can't remember the tune, but I remember his name. Not at any given time did I ever know that he was a gay civil rights leader. Nor were we, like, we weren't told these things. We were just told these are the people you need to esteem. And these are the people that, you know, paved the way so that you can live the life you live today. And I'm like, well, wait, wait a minute. Something, something else is going here. He, he was, yes, an indispensable force in the civil rights movement, but he was openly gay. And him, and, and you know, now, like I said, I'm trying to keep the personal stuff out of it, but him and King were like besties. They, they were besties. What happened? Where'd you go? Where'd you, where'd you go? Oh, don't leave me out here by myself because I I knew who Bayard Weston was, but it wasn't until recently that I was like, wait a minute. He was he was out here wilding like this. And it, it was like everybody knew and my little fourth grade self, like, well, they didn't they left out that part. Yeah. yeah. And it makes you wonder why why did they leave that out? Yeah. I, I, again, I, I, I go back to revisionist history and, you know, this this was what was desired to be promoted. And again, I, I you know, I, I, I share that not to the point and even given that information is for the purpose of showing you that the old civil rights movement and this new thing that we're looking at right now are directly connected. And, and so for people to be shocked for me to make a statement like, you know, if you're celebrating King, you know, a part of his legacy had everything to do with with the promotion of, of same sex marriage, same all of these all of these things. Um, and folks are just, you know, apoplectic. They're just freaking out. And I'm like, it, all of it's there. Like the information is there. All you have to do is just unpack it, look at it honestly and assess it. Like I just discovered more information. Well, he organized the March on Washington. Like I, you know, I had learned that. Yes. But. He learned Quaker values. This is from the History Channel. Like, history.com is like, he learned Quaker values of nonviolence and peace from an early age. 
And his confidence in those beliefs and in himself were reinforced by his grandmother, Julia Rustin, who affirmed his sexuality, a response that was nearly unheard of at the time. This man was born in 1912. Yes. This wasn't what was hot on the street back then. Then it says, according to Bayard, she wasn't concerned so much about him dating men. She was more concerned about the men that he chose. I'm just like, huh? Oh, okay. All right. Well, we 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 gonna keep it moving. Cause yeah, mm, I'm just saying. So this is my show, and even I'm having moments of like, wait a minute. I wasn't ready for all of that. And I'm 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 doing this, and I'm bringing this up because we all need to be uncomfortable with uncomfortable truth. I don't take pleasure in learning that all of the civil rights heroes of my childhood. You know, forget the character. I'm talking about the actual issues that they truly believed in, but I was led to believe that it was something else. Like, I, you need to know these things so that, one, the scriptures tell us that we are not to be held captive or, or led astray, right, um, by every wind of doctrine. And we can't just hitch our wagon to every single movement just because on the surface, it seems like it's on the up and up. We need to be looking on the like on the back end, like, well, wait a minute, let me just give this some time. And that's, we tried to do that with BLM. I can't right. tell you how much pushback I received when I was telling people, I was like, nah, this BLM ain't what you want. I done read the website. These folks want to destroy the heteronuclear family. They're telling you who they are and that it's not about families and black men and black women and black babies it's something else and they're like well we can still say black lives matter and we don't have to believe that it's just like are, did you hear anything i just said like are, right. were you listening right go ahead bro no absolutely i think all all of these kinds of things are important i love i'm, I'm starting to pick up some of the some of the comments and uh I, what will christian dear what christian is right that you you won't you won't be able to find a sermon where King preached a biblical gospel. Uh, I've listened. I've listened to. I've listened to hundreds of hours uh, over the course of my lifetime of of King and his sermons and the like. And you, you, I, if someone finds one, please send it. I've never heard him preach about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, he didn't and, believe and the, it. Yeah, and the Just reason like that, Raphael Warnock preached one. He. Did, mm -mm. And and the you you let you 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 nailed it. And the reason for that is he didn't believe he didn't believe that. And so that's why you're not going to hear what you're going to hear is some version of of the social gospel, which today we call social justice. Um, so mm -hmm. that's 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 what he advocated for. That's what he preached. Uh, and that's that's what I mean. That, that's what what the civil rights movement was about. So I go back to your, your you know the, the initial premise, which was um, we have a presupposition that civil rights and the civil rights movement. Was a good thing, uh, and and my 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 thing is in a, in a sentence, tell me what the civil rights movement did that was good that that um, that, that we could point to that we didn't already have uh, in in the Constitution of the United States. Well, most of us have never read the Constitution, so the average person it's going to be difficult for them to answer that because they're just like I don't even know what's in the Constitution. Like er I believe everybody should have a pocket. Constitution, like I carry one. I don't care how many times I switch purchase purses. I mean, I, I keep Jesus in my heart, my nine on my hip. You know, I always have a digital copy of my Bible and I always have my constitution. I just kind of that's like my everyday setup. Yeah, yeah. But I, I was I was a little I was a little shocked when I walked in the in the furniture store and saw you had your you had your nine on your hip. I'm like, oh snap. Sis ain't playing up in here. Both no. better, both, both better not show up in here acting up, that's for sure. Listen, they don't, they're going to be carried out by, they don't, these, these ain't the problems that you want. They're just, they're just not. I got so many guns up in this house. <laughs> I'm finding, I'm like, why is there one here? Rob was like, you just, you just never know. I'm like, <laughs> okay. He's, he's always planting them in new places. But I'm like, well, can you tell me in case some, we, we have a lot of entrances. So you got to have one at yep. any given time close close by, you know, this is a pretty safe area, but so the overall conclusion, and we're going to take some questions. Um, I do want to acknowledge, I had some super chats. I'm so grateful for you guys. Willie doc says, um, 
Oh, I already read that one. And then I had another one from, where did it go? I saw David Morell in the house. You guys check out the Protestia channel. Very, very good brother in the Lord. Oh, Willie Doc left another one. Thank you. He says, some um, have said that white conservative theology schools should be blamed for MLK because they wouldn't accept him. Is that a fair assessment? I'm trying to make sure I understand the question. I can't remember the context in which it was said. White conservative the theological schools should be blamed for MLK because they wouldn't accept him. Is that oh meaning they wouldn't accept him for admission? Right. I think that right. is that but isn't Crozier like Crozier was Cro Cro Crozier was up north. It was uh it was I believe it was in Pennsylvania, if I'm not mistaken. Was um it, was it in Boston? Well Crozier. he went to he went to he went to Boston College for his doctorate. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, you could you could say that if if I mean, I, here's my thought. Regardless, he didn't have to adopt even at even at the, even at the institution that he was at. He didn't have to adopt unbiblical points of view. Uh, no one was pushing, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, heterodoxy on him. Uh, he 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 embraced this uh, and felt that it was it was the school that he was at that gave him the full breadth and depth of of ability to express himself. And, and one of the things I, I would say, if you go back and read about uh, him historically, uh, he, he doesn't, the, his profession of faith, his testimony is more connected to uh, the, the thing that opened his eyes was a relationship that he had with a, with a little white boy that he played with that at a certain point in the age range, uh, they couldn't play any longer because the white parents didn't want their white son playing with a black child. So when, when you talk about what converted him uh, he spent more time talking about that and its impact on his life and how he wanted to see the world tr transformed as a result. His, 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 his transition, his, his you know, come to Jesus moment had nothing to do with Jesus, had everything to do with the fact that he couldn't play with, a, with his white friend and wanted to see that, see that fixed. And so, um, it, you, and, and again, these are not my words. You can find any of the, like, you can go, you can go online tonight go to YouTube and just and look up Dr. King's testimony and find exactly what I'm talking about out of King's own mouth. You won't have to believe what I'm saying about it. Right. So, so far we have where the civil rights movement, we largely abandoned economic self-sufficiency in exchange to embrace political power. We have that. And I, I would say that that's probably, that was very detrimental because when you abandon economic self-sufficiency and embrace political power, this is how I want to start talking about the, uh, the depravity of man. Yeah. Because if you think about all these civil rights movement, all these civil rights leaders, when they got the political power, the, the pride and the desire to be in control yes. was more important than we need to actually deal and provide viable answers to the problems in our community. It was no longer about the economic self-sufficiency. We had already proved, proven that by just rallying together for 382 days that we were an economic powerhouse to be reckoned with. But they just abandoned that and started, what is the word that I'm looking for? It, it was like, we just wanted the appeal of saying, yay, we're equal versus like, wait, we were already equal and now we're not building. And now you have the doctrine of eternal victimhood where all of these civil rights leaders, the Al Sharptons, the Jamal Bryans, the Raphael Warnocks, all they want to do is keep us as a perpetual victim about how we're just being oppressed. And held down. And when I'm thinking about it, I'm like, without this narrative, you really wouldn't have much political power. I no. think this is more about political power for you because yeah. we never talk. You never hear them talk about strengthening the black family. Mm -hmm. That's off code. That's off script. They're not going to talk to me about how how the civil rights movement effectively ushered in the breakdown of the black family, in your yeah. opinion. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I cataloged it well. The Moynihan Report comes out uh, in '64, and and as a result, what happens after that is uh, there there are government policies that are put in place. Uh, '65 in '65, Senator Moynihan uh, Moynihan Report, the Negro Family, the case for national action. Now, now get mm -hmm. this: the, the the idea behind that is 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 you know there, there's so much uh, you know so, so many bad things happening in the family. 
uh, in black families, there's so much poverty that government now has to step in uh, and, and take control. And, and it was the policies of, of, of Lyndon Baines Johnson who would come along and say, hey, we need to create these great society policies. Now, he was no friend to black folks, but he saw a political opportunity uh, when, he, when he could find one and, and began instituting uh, all, all, of the, all of these kind of welfare programs uh, that would, would eventually, and again, they were, they, were, they were put forth under the guise of helping the black family. But what they ended up doing was they empowered black women uh, to marry the government uh, and to not really connect with black men to the point where today uh, we have, we have you know, 27, only 27% of black women are actually getting married. Right. So so three out of four black women are saying now nah, to marriage uh, at, are, are maintaining singlehood. And, and the quickest way to poverty is to have a child outside of wedlock. Uh, they are they're, It's lower than any other group. And, and, and I said in the piece that children suffer uh, when black men and fathers are not in the home. Uh, and, and when government services incentivize separation, there's more of it. Right. And, and generations right. of black children are, are in trouble. You think about the issues around Planned Parenthood. There's another piece that I wrote that will be published in a, a, another um, place as a blog, uh, a, a blog journal called um, Christ Over All. Uh, and they mm -hmm. asked me, you can check out their stuff, Christ Over All, I think, dot com. Uh, they asked me to write an article about King and, uh, and the issue of abortion. Uh, and so in that article, I'll send it to, I'll, yeah, I'll send it to you. Oh, no, this is too much. I'm still trying to, like, even Connie gets it. She's like, Virgin, I messed up some folks this week. First, Jason Whitlock almost in tears at the thought of removing his MLK pick, and now April. Like, I know I got a church fan in here somewhere. I know I do. <laughs> I'm just, I mean, I, I had already reconciled these truths, but now it's worse than before because I hadn't considered the implications of this new social justice movement and this new civil rights era and how it's pig, it's on the backs of the foundation that was laid by the first one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, Connie, you got me, girl. You're right. Absolutely. So I I, uh, I wrote that piece. That'll come out, I think, sometime either Friday or sometime next week. I'll send it to you when it comes out. It'll be in a whole different lane of, of folks that will be exposed to to some of the things that that, that I'm writing about. But I, I, I mentioned that because I mentioned abortion and Planned Parenthood. It was it was uh, Martin Luther King who received uh, the Margaret Sanger Award. Margaret Sanger is yeah. the person who instituted uh, Planned Parenthood and 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 the, the whole abortion industry. She began her career in eugenics. And if you don't understand the the racist nature of eugenics, uh, I catalog it in this article in this piece. I show you how they intended to to have population control within within uh, black communities, particularly, uh, but also those they they believe to be quote unquote feeble minded. Uh, right. and, and, and here was a crazy part about that. She was so successful in, during her time frame where where the government would had instituted federal funding for forced sterilizations throughout the country. So within 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 black communities, particularly, in fact, King actually had a civil rights uh, a worker on on, you know, working with with him uh, that was impacted by Sanger's. Uh, uh, forced abortion programs. It was kind of common knowledge uh, in parts of Mississippi and Alabama that if you had an appendectomy or you had any kind of surgery, don't go to that hospital or that hospital or that hospital if you were female, because when you left, they, they did this magic thing on you where you were never able to have babies again. And, and all of that was a part of the eugenics process that took place back in the 1920s and 1930s. And eventually King would be the one who would receive the Margaret Sanger Planned Parenthood Award. So again, there's there's a lot of lot of connection points to make. There are a lot of things to think about. But that's a whole different piece. But none of this has been helpful to the Black community. We've hitched our wagons to the Democratic Party. It has not served us well in any way, shape, or form. It's enriched a handful of politicians. Uh, mm. It's just, it's destroyed uh, any community where you see a majority Democratic-run city. It is absolute chaos. Uh, it is an absolute crim a criminal haven. Uh, it, it, it's horrifying. And so that's that's the that's the legacy of both civil rights, the civil rights movement and what we've hitched our wagons to. And what it did, April, was it's it separated. Uh, it, it provided for us 
a, a secondary constitution, which what mm -hmm. that did was rather than rather than advocate for equality, what it began doing was it began promoting equal outcomes. And the way that it did that was the Civil Rights Act of 1964 established things like the Civil Rights Commission in Title IV. Uh, it established uh, a, a title, title VI where companies who had 15 employees or more could be scrutinized by the federal government to ensure that they were meeting uh, certain, you know, certain standards uh, by which black, there were so many blacks, there were so many white. Now people may think, oh, it's a great idea to make sure that there are this many blacks and this many whites and this many Asians and this many Hispanics. But when you have an overarching federal government structure and system now showing up at the business that you created with your Come own on. thought, with your own money, your own efforts, your own, and, and they're telling you that you should hire this person, not on the basis of their skill set, but on the basis of the color of their skin, I promise you, you have pushback. Now, right. the, the counter argument to that is, well, you know, it, it should be, they, they should be hiring anyway. My thing is this, if a restaurant decides they don't want to hire you or they don't want to serve you, let them do that. What we should do is, from a standpoint of self-sufficiency, is take our dollars and show up at the restaurant that will serve you, that will take care of you. And you tell everybody in the community that that's the restaurant to go to. They Come will on. have more money. The other restaurant will have less money. One will go out of business. The other will prosper or start your own. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. I ain't even about to beg you to like me. I'm going to just be like, you know what? I'm going to get my own restaurant. At least I can make the mac and cheese the way I like it. <laughs> I like what you said about the results. I'm still struggling to answer the question about what did we gain through the civil rights movement that we didn't already have by way of the Constitution. Um, I, I'm, I don't have an answer for nope, that. Nobody, no, I'm, I'm going to tell you this right now. Nobody will. And, and, and they can say what they want. Well, yes, Jim Crow was in place. Yes, but listen. The way that that was tested in the Montgomery bus boycott was the right way to do it. They tested the Constitution and the Constitution held. Now, are there instances when the Constitution won't hold? Absolutely. There will be because there's flawed human beings, sinful human beings who are on the bench. They don't they don't stop being sinful because they showed up at the, you know, at, at, at the Supreme Court. At right. the end of the day, our trust is not in government. Our trust is in is in God. Uh, and if we trust God, we walk that out and we figure out ways to be self-sufficient, to be independent. And of all the places in the world where you have an unjust system or things are unjustly structured, the capitalistic system that we have in the United States of America is the best system in the world for weeding that out, dampening that back. But see, we had a we had a messed up idea about about equality. It wasn't an idea that we've been, we've been given equality on the basis of image bearers of God. Our thought was we'd be given equality on the basis of government, government coming in, intervening on our behalf and setting things straight. So what is it that you think fuels this equal outcomes thing? Because I'm, I'm of the opinion that I'm like, y'all are just covetous. Why do you feel you need to have exactly what somebody else has? Like, I don't, when I hear equal outcomes, that's concerning for me because I'm just like, well, wait a minute. I don't I don't have the same skills as person over there. I don't you know, I'm just deficient in this area. Why? Why? Why would I expect to have the same outcome when they're putting in more effort or I'm putting in more effort? Um, can you talk to like, where do you think is that just part of our sinful nature to expect equal outcomes? Yeah, I, that, that's a that's a great question. When I for me, I've never wanted an equal outcome because in my mind, I was always going to be willing to outwork you. Uh, uh -huh. I, I I may not be smarter. Like like from an early age, I had a dad who told me. I had a dad. My father had a sixth grade education. Right, my father could barely read. He was functionally illiterate. Um, my, my dad, my dad. You know, there were times when I was I was helping my dad. He had his own business. 
I would help my dad to read the, the, the chemicals that we were pouring into certain things so that we could, he had the, the business that he was in, he was a, uh, he, he did, uh, uh, you know, the cleanup after hours type stuff. We were, we were, we would, we would take care of uh, uh, buildings and clean up the building and let, you know, as the business folks left, we would show up. I was reading stuff to my dad so he could mix the right stuff together so that we could wash windows so that we could clean desks so that we could take out trash and all those kinds of things. And so, uh, my dad never, even though he, he, he operated and functioned that way, he, he never, it was never, well, you black, we ain't never going to be, or we ain't never, I mean, I, I, I my, and my dad, my dad was, was not the smartest man. He told me, he said, so you, you definitely may not be the smartest, but you have every ability to outwork anybody you come into contact with. And as a result, your outcome is going to be what you put into it. And so I've always had that mindset, which is why I was always willing to wake up earlier and stay up later than anybody else. And so that's that's just my mindset. So I never came to any idea that I would be less than I thought, oh, I'm going to take that person out. So I never needed an affirmative action because, you know, if, 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 if we're on an equal playing field, I'm going to take you out. That's how that's going to work. <laughs> You, know, you want to level? You don't really want the playing field level. You don't, you don't want the playing field level with me. I promise you. So that that was that that was my mindset. And I definitely once I did well, I definitely didn't want to. I definitely didn't want to be in a situation where whatever you got was going to be equal to what I got. No, no, no I wanted what was coming. And, right. And I, and Give I me all mine. Good. Absolutely, that was all mine. Absolutely. So that was my. That's always been my mindset. So that, that that's a part of it. But we've been in in the. In the educational system, in the school systems that we currently have, say it. What is actually being taught is is equal outcomes. The the, the picture that everyone is now given is, is this idea that we're all running the race, and all of us are on the are on the starting line. And y'all have seen that example where they say, "Well, if you if you have two par if you have a one parent home, take take one step backwards. You know, if you have if you have both parents." Take one step forward. Well, if you've had uh, a good school, take two steps forward. If you've had this positive outcome, take three steps forward. And then they stop. And then you look back and you got all these black folks are sitting at the first, you know, at the, at the starting line or back behind the line. And all these white folks that are standing ahead of the line or three, you know, or, or three miles a, a ahead. And so the, so the, the, the scenario that they paint for you is this idea that we're all equal running this race and see because of what took place in the lives of these people, they are benefited and what took place in the lives of those people, they have been, they have been subjugated. So now we need to do something for them. When the reality is that whole framework is messed up because none of us are running the same race. No, right. None of us, none of us are, none of us are starting on the same line and none of us are running the same race. April, you're running a race that God uniquely gave you and Robert to run. Virgil and Tamika over here in West Egypt or West Jerusalem, we 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 run in a totally different race over here, right? right. Somebody else down the road around the corner, Dr. Dr. Jo Josh Bice, who I work for, that man's run a totally different race altogether. And so we're not even on the same starting line. I've been equipped with everything I need to run the race that I've been given. So at the end of the day, when my race is done, like Paul, I can look for Christ to say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's all I need to hear. I don't need to worry about whether you had two parents or I had one or you had this happen or I didn't have that. I don't have to worry about all that. And we need to get out of that mindset. The thing that str I struggled with is that when I look back in history at our ancestors, when I look at the Booker T. Washingtons and the Frederick, like, Booker T managed to walk on foot with shoes that did not conform to his feet with wooden soles. I mean, yes. to West Virginia, yes. then from Virginia to Hampton yes. and then down to Tuskegee to build a whole school. Like, I, I'm just like, don't tell me that we all need to be at the, the, the starting line at the same time. Like, doesn't even make sense. And I'm just like, we're not a weak people. That is not who we are. That is not the stock that we come from. Why are we allowing these people to tell us that, well, you know, you know, when you got a single mama, you just, you just can't do good. You know, you just gotta, we gotta do something for you because you were, you were at a disadvantage or, you know, well, your daddy won there. So I don't know. You just need to give up on life. Like where I don't, are there parents 
actually raising their children this way? Because I can't even formulate my lips to tell my child that they can't do something or be something because they don't have what someone else has. Yeah. I, I, I've i seen it back in the day, April, I used to do, I used to, I was, a, I was a military recruiter and I would go into school systems and talk to kids about opportunities and such. I, I remember going into a, a lot of disadvantaged schools, uh, you know, financially struggling schools. And, and I would have teachers tell me, listen, don't get their hopes up on stuff they can't achieve. I, I had, te- I would have teachers who would tell me that. Wow. So, so it, 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 it's very real. It's very evident, and it's it's very much in the fabric and DNA of of, of some of the poor performing schools. Uh, but 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 also it, it's it's definitely in what you see uh, from the social justice movement. I mean, that's a whole movement now. It's really a religion it that is. is preaching the you know the gospel of grievance. Uh, it, it it's it's pre it's preaching uh, n- not prosperity but poverty. Uh, yep. that, that that now poverty poverty is is virtuous. Uh, you know, being 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 uh, ignorant is virtuous. Uh, wh- whatever whatever you could find to attach yourself to some level of victimhood is now virtuous, and that's kind of where we are. Right. So, like, someone brought up the point that you know, well, how is it that you know we're claiming to be running the same race, but we're tripping each other up while we're we're tripping each other up while we're being tripped up? Like, run faster. Like, why are you worried about somebody else? Like, the amount of energy that you expend worrying about what someone else is doing to you or how they in your way, be better. Right, like right. you can't live your life being an internal victim. You will find yourself, you will never get above ground zero because you're the energy that you're expending worrying about who tripping you up, you could be doing like, all right, you know what? I got to take this detour because I already know over there, this, that, and the third is happening. I'm going to spend my energy using my God-given talents and ability to be better. But if if at every turn and that everything we say, all you have is another excuse, it's no reason why you're no further along than you are because right. you're spending your energy focused on the wrong thing. Your eyes is everywhere but on, I got to go. I'm trying to get here. I ain't worried about this, that, and the third, the white man, the green man. Like I'm not worried about them because I have a mission to accomplish. None right. of our forefathers thought this way. They, they accomplished more with less, couldn't yes. read, actual real racism where it was like, you can't walk on this side of the street or else. And they were just like, okay, well, I'm just go around, but I'm about to go open up my shop over here that's mine on my 28 acres of land. And they dealt with real opposition. Like yeah. nobody is in your way. It's all in your head. I'm sorry. Yes. I don't mean to be real brash and abrasive about it, but at some point you got to talk to your people because you love them enough to be like, just stop. You sound weak. That is not who we are. That is not who we are. And if you like sounding weak, you and your weak selves go over there. But us over here, we're going to build and we're not going to allow other people to get in our way to stop the train. So you can get off the train, but we're, we're doing this over here. So we need to do two things. We got to take a commercial break because I forgot. And we're almost at the top of the hour. We're going to take a quick commercial break. Then Virgil's going to come back on. We're going to take some questions. So here's what I need you to do, gang. If you're in the chat and you have a question, even if it's an opposing view, like we're not scared of y'all. We're going to answer all the questions, right? Um, But we're going to give, you know, try to give people equal time. If you're just being a troll, we ain't going to spend all the time on your question. But leave a cue and then type your question. I will star it and then we will answer it. But we need to go to commercial break. Um, and and when, when, we, when we come back from commercial break, I, I, I see this issue about North Tulsa. Actually, I lived in Tulsa. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and because I keep I keep this this response to Tulsa and, and the Tulsa race riot, I think what I'm going to do in February is I'm going to unpack the, the, the issue of Tulsa because Tulsa, the t- Tulsa got rebuilt after the race riot. And folks don't know what actually took place there. And, and that, that's that's, a, that's another myth I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to take apart in, in February. Ooh, let's get it. All right. Well, hold on tight, guys. Sit tight. Come on back. Here's a word from our sponsor. God is sovereign over everything. He is sovereign over the entire universe. He is sovereign over nature. He literally has created everything that exists 
out of nothing. It is the doctrine of sovereign election that empowers and ignites missions, and it is the doctrine of sovereign election that guarantees the success of missions around the world. We will not build the church according to the changing whims of an ungodly culture. We will change that ungodly culture by the power of the immutable gospel. All I have is God wrapped himself in flesh, died on a cross, nailed my sin thereto, was placed in the grave, rose again on the third day, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and is there making intercession for me until such time as my salvation is completed and he takes me home. The more they see, the more they will love him. Stop giving them all this silly fodder and life principles and lay before them. Live your life in solitude crying out to God. Live your life on your knees. Live your life with your Bibles torn asunder. Live your life for the people of God to be able to present to them the beauty of what he is, the glory of his cross. There is no such thing as mother nature. God rules and reigns over everything. There's not a leaf that falls from a tree that God did not call it to fall at that very moment. God is in control of every single thing meticulously ruling over the entire universe. Join us for the 2023 G3 National Conference on the Sovereignty of God. You guys, I absolutely love that commercial. I absolutely love that. It makes, well, well it makes me want to shout, especially when Paul Wash should be hollering and screaming. I'd be like, yes, live your life with your Bible. Yeah. Anyway, Virgil, talk to us about G3. Tell my audience, we have people who are like, I've never been to a G3. What oh, is man. a G3? Who is a G3? Talk about it for me. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm excited. I, I, thank you for playing that uh, video. I was, I was actually one of the, one of the people responsible for it pulling all of those elements together and getting the folks that, uh, that, uh, that helped to uh, help to make it happen uh, together. That's a part of my role here at G3. G3 stands for gospel, grace, and glory. Uh, it began as a conference-based ministry. Uh, it is now a, a content producing juggernaut. Uh, there's so many great things that we're producing from, from podcasts uh, to blog posts, uh, to books, to curriculum for, for homeschool, to, to things for churches, to, to free things on our webs. I mean, every day it is something new. I was just talking with Scott Annual. There's, there's, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of about a dozen books that we want to get uh, published this year alone. It's just an um, immense amount of work. My side of the house uh, deals with the traditional side of, of G3, which has been the conferences. Uh, so I'm responsible for providing oversight for all of our national conferences, which is a biennial conference every two years. Uh, and this is a massive conference. It's a national conference. Last year we had, or uh, 2021, when the conference was last time, we had 6,500 people at that conference. Uh, we had 30 some odd speakers at, at that conference. <coughs> Everybody from Paul Washer uh, to uh, Dr. Josh Bice to uh, Stephen Lawson, uh, you, you name it. We had Bodie Bauckham. Uh, we, we had John McCarthy. You, you name a big name. They were there. Uh, and the same thing will be true this year. We'll have a number of those back and we're adding on to it. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity that I have. And, and, and I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting ready to spice some things up. So y'all want to be at this one. Uh, we've got some plans that, that are in place to, to are mix Are you up. adding some lorries? Oh, see, come on now. <laughs> you know what I mean when I say that? It's not that. I'm just asking. I'm yes. just asking. Little Laurie's ain't never hurt nobody because last the last regional conference we had Hensworth Jonas from um is he from he's from Antigua. Okay. We put some Laurie's on that. I was like, go ahead, Jonas. It was good. It was it was amazing. Yes. Yes. Know. Yes. And and so we def, definitely and I'm I'm bringing in some 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 younger folks as well. We're gonna mix up some of those Q and As. And really just, it's going to be very dynamic. You will want to be a part. 
Uh, if you've never been a part of the G3 conference, you're absolutely missing out. April and I connected in that space, knew one another from social media, connected on that space. She was very gracious and kind to me, brought me to her first little Q&A at her church and got me connected and, and, and all plugged in and uh, to see what God has done through uh, the course of my life and, and, and what, uh, what's transpired to the point where now I'm interacting with uh, just some, some, some of my heroes in the faith on a, on a daily basis. It's absolutely amazing. You will not want to miss it. It's on the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. Uh, every, when, I, when, I, when I look at culture, culture is attacking God's sovereignty. Uh, church is wrestling with biblical sufficiency. So you have God's sovereignty on one end, you have biblical sufficiency on the other. So we're going to gather and unpack uh, particularly the sovereignty of God and make sure people are educated, encouraged, and equipped to go back to local churches and really fight the battle that's being waged right now. So this is one you won't want to miss. Uh, we anticipate someone in the neighborhood of about 7,000 people there. Okay, um, listen, I love y'all, but that's too many people. That's a lot of folk. As the last G3, I didn't even get to say hi to everybody because of so many people. I didn't even see Kofi. I see yes. Kofi every time I go to G3. I was yes. just like, I think I saw him in passing and he was so far away. I was like, I ain't gonna see him this whole time. It was just like, it's too, it was too loud. He couldn't see me. I'm too little. It just, it just didn't work out. I'm gonna, I'm, 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 my, my plan is to set up little pockets of meeting spaces and places for key people for social media folks and for folks who, you know, some influencers and different things. So there'll be opportunities like that where you go into this space, get a chance to meet, connect. Folks will come in and meet you. It's going to be somebody really, really cool. We've, we've got some, we've got some things set up so that this very large event will end up feeling very small and very family-like for, for folks who have been coming for a long time. So I've got a bunch of ideas around that, that I'm working uh, around the clock to make happen. Okay, that's cool. So guys, if you guys want to save 30% on your registration, go to g3men.org, go to the events tab, see the Sovereignty of God banner, click registration and use my promo code G3STP to save 30% off. Registration is going up, what, February 1st? February 1st. Right, yeah. Listen, I'm trying to help you here. If you yes. just want to pay more, they're going to take your money. But if you want to save some money before it goes up, Go ahead and use my discount code and get that out the way. You still have time to book your hotel. Like, I don't even think I book. I know where I'm staying. I always stay at the same hotel, but I, I don't tend to book my hotel this soon. But with all these people coming, I might need to um, because I don't want the, the courtyard to sell out. <laughs> so. I'm, just this, I'm telling you, I like get on it because okay. I'm, I'm, I'm already getting calls about places. We, we've, we've taken blocks to, and, and took, took the whole hotel. And I'm getting calls. Oh, that hotel's full. Oh, that hotel's full. So it's, you, I would tell you to get on it. Don't wait. Okay. I know it feels overwhelming. And this is why I, I even have some international travelers that are coming. And this is not official with G3, but I am forming my own little international welcome committee. I've got what these things I call, it's called the conference buddy. So I've got some emails already from people who've signed up and say, I'll be a conference buddy to help our international travelers who like, listen, I've never been to Atlanta before. I don't know nobody. Can y'all just be my buddy to kind of help me get acclimated? Because eight, 7,000 people is a little overwhelming. So if you want to be a conference buddy, feel free to email me at info at the standard of truth podcast.com. Um, I am helping coordinate that because I want our brethren from across the pond to feel welcome. So we definitely are um, doing that. Uh, do, do we have G3 merch? Oh, yeah. Hey, Tamika. Hi, girly. She said there's some G3 merch. I see your bug right there. So we might we might need some some G3 merch. So, OK, this this is exciting. Mm -hmm. Anyway. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to we said that before the break. What did we? I don't forget. What did we say? We you're going gonna to ask. You're going to ask questions. I'm looking oh. at some, I, I just I just want to pop. Mary M.M. said. Thanks, Virgil. Uh, I just watched that. I, I, I just want to watch that ad on a loop. That, that 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 means that means that means the world to me. You have no idea what it took to pull that off. And the and the hardest part of pulling that off was getting Dr. Josh Bice to agree to close that to walk down that space and to close. He did not. He fought. I could then, tell he was like, he, fought, I really he, he did not want to be in that commercial. I'm like, you got to do it. In fact, Tamika was with me the night that that we 
we recorded that. We actually recorded that in our in our church's uh, 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 gym. That was actually really? in our gym. Yeah, yeah. I, I was like, when did they record this? Because I was like, this looks like it was in the exhibit hall. No, that was actually in the gym. In, in fact, that that whole frame that you see with the G3. Uh, uh, the, the Jumbotron. Portrait, right, and yeah. The Jumbotron. That's all in our gym. We did all that in the gym. You guys did an amazing job. Because I was like, how Thank did they pull all this foolish together? And I was like, how did they get Josh to walk down there like that? He did not. He did not want to do that at all. I, I, I've spent I've spent at least 20 months getting him ready. <laughs> gracious. He just he didn't want to do it. Job. He does not. And, and again, I, 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 I honor the man. He doesn't want to be. He, he, his concern is he wants to always point to Christ. Right. He's always to Christ. He doesn't want to be a front guy or lead guy or any of that. Even even in our decision making process, it's a collective effort. Myself, Josh, Scott, Annual, we're kind of an executive team who makes the decisions, and he's just. I mean, but I'm so glad. I, I got goosebumps when I saw my man of God. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> man of God. Hey, come on. I was like, go ahead, Jay, go ahead, Jay. I think he did an amazing job because the timing was just right. Yep. The end. I absolutely love that commercial. I was just like, yeah. this was very, very well done. So y'all, y'all got to come. Y'all got to come to G three. Yep. Um, I've gotten emails from someone coming from Nigeria, mm -hmm. someone coming from the UK. Um, I can't remember the other one, but they've all asked for conference buddies, and I've already got some volunteers. So. I'm excited about it. You know, these people are excited to fellowship with us and the breakout sessions are going to be amazing. I have a booth at the G3 so you can come and we can take selfies and it's going to it's going to be really, really nice. But we do. We do have some questions. Let me get to these questions. I'm going to tell, tell people this. Y'all need to go and sign up and use her promo code. I've got a contest going and you definitely want to help my sister April get get be at the top of the list on that contest. So the more you use her code, the more you tell people to use her code, the more opportunity she has to win my contest. So yeah, like I'm trying to figure out why you're even participating in the conference contest. I was like, this is nope. so not fair. <laughs> why is the Just Thinking podcast count? Y'all shouldn't even be in the running. Y'all were picking up on us. You had like 38 registrations. I was like, I had eight. I had eight. Can I be cool? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 got you're doing just fine. Believe me, you're doing just fine. I still don't think y'all should have been included. It wasn't. You're wrong. Got, we, we've got we've got a lot of volunteers and admin. We're, I'm blessing those. I'm blessing those ladies. I'm not even. I don't get. I already got. I already got my merch, so I'm good to go. So I guess it's fine. All right. So we had some questions. Um, this one, the first one was waiting for it's a little delay. Does April's remark? of the inferiority complex explain why the woke mob seems to need uh, race, gender, and sexuality swap characteristics to give um, in a, in a modern example. I think I understand the question. Do you, mm -hmm. is that okay for you? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, I think it's, I think it's, a, I think it's a spot on observation. I, you know, I think, um, you know, definitely based upon the, 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 the culture at the time uh, in the time of the the sixties, uh, definitely blacks ha had every reason to feel inferior. Everything in culture was 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 saying that everything that they were interacting with uh, was saying that uh, most of those, though, who understood uh, Christ and him crucified were serious about their faith. They, they felt, acted and responded uh, differently. But if you were if you were absorbed into the, the civil rights movement and you know, we shall overcome someday, all of those ideas around that. Uh, really, really reinforced, uh, and I, I think I even said that in my piece. What what the what desegregating the buses did, and the manner in which it did, it, it said to black folk, you know, you having your own thing, having your own black Uber, wasn't as important as being on these buses with these folks who don't care for you, uh, you know, regardless of of what they've allowed to happen based upon an economic condition or a Supreme Court decision. Wow. So do you think like it was a matter of, well, we just want the right to be able to sit there. But for me, I'm just like, okay, well, once you get the right, you can choose to sit there or choose not to. But I, I think we should have kept that economic 
um, cooperative going where we pulled pulled our resources together and we we made something happen. Like that was, there were so many, I, I've heard that there were so many black taxi services that were started from that and yes. how profitable they were. And then once yes. the boycott ended, it was just like, well, people literally took their business elsewhere. Right. Right. I mean, it's, it's it, the same thing happened in every in every situation you had. You had the Negro League. Right. And uh, it was doing well. All these uh, incredible sports uh, athletes who were doing their thing. The, the Negro League was was more fun to watch. Uh, blacks enjoyed that. They were segregated from, you know, baseball. But then desegregation happens. And then what happens that the, the Negro League is actually absolutely destroyed as everybody is trying to do everything they can to get into get, get get into the major leagues, it happened every single time. Uh, rather than us dictating the terms by which uh, we would we would decide to integrate. Wow, that's 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 really sad. Um, and we had another one. Uh, how do we approach talking to people about MLK? Well, I you know I, I've I've taken a different route that I don't encourage the faint at heart to take. Um, I would just say that, uh, you know, I, I think you can appreciate uh, based upon common grace that that someone was willing to take a stand for what they believed, even to the point of, of it costing them their lives. But I think you have to have a clear eyed view of King's theology, his ideology and his methodology and how detrimental it was long term uh, to the black community. Um, you know, there are going to be folks who don't want to hear that, who, 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 have, who have all but deified, deified Martin Luther King, and there's not much you can say to them. Um, I think my piece helps uh, because it lays everything out and people can go back to the links uh, and identify, well, these aren't Virgil's words. King actually said that himself, or this, this, uh, what he's saying about the Constitution isn't his idea, but okay, I can click this link and go back and see uh, I can read it for myself and, and there are links that help you understand what's being said in the process. So I, I really was, I spent a lot of time doing the research because of the fact that I wanted in one document uh, yeah. for people to be able to study the ideas surrounding the arguments all, all, all put together in one place. Wow. Okay. Um, this one was cute. It was funny. It was just like, why are y'all worrying about a person that's dead? What church is he pastoring Oh, that's nah. good. That's that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, I think, and I, I, and and the, here here's why. Um, there are a lot of folks who have are, are long gone and dead, whose life are is is impacting us today. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and in fact, I, I mean, you mentioned Jamal J uh, Jamal Bryant. Uh, you mentioned Raphael Warnock. The thing that motivated me to go back and take a look at the civil rights movement was the midterm elections. Come on. I mean, I, I mean, it really was because as, as I watched the midterm, I'm sitting here, brand new resident in the state of Georgia. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm now I'm now registered to vote and, and I'm watching this midterm election happen. And I'm, I'm watching Stacey Abrams go into churches on a Sunday morning in black churches all over the state uh, and preach a message of death. Uh, yes. So solving economic problems by aborting children was her response to uh, to inflation. Uh, going into churches saying, you know, I, I grew up with with two parents who were pastors uh, and, and, and they understood the importance of, of the right to choose. Uh, they understood that, that, that abortion is a, is a woman's right. So I'm and I'm watching these black churches and folks are just applauding this nonsense like like she just preached the gospel. And they I'm sure thinking, did. I'm liking thinking, her to Deborah and everything. Absolutely. I'm thinking what have have folk lost their mind? I'm watching black pastors grab Raphael Warnock, put him in the center of these mega churches, lay hands on him like he is David fighting Goliath. It's, it's the craziest thing. It was the craziest thing I'd ever seen. And I'm thinking, how are they? They know this man has been open about the fact that he's pro-choice. That that in you know in the tweet that he put out, he said, "I'm you know I I don't think that a, that a hospital room is large enough for a, a woman, her doctor, and the in the United States government, and and didn't and didn't mention the, the God he claimed to serve or preach about." Right. Like, I'm like, how how is this even possible? So as I'm watching this whole thing unfold, Jamal Bryant after the Dobbs decision, crying like a little girl. 
on the platform like he was about to miscarry a baby. I mean, it was the it was the <laughs> it was the craziest thing I'd ever seen. Like he was he was crying because the right to murder a child was no longer available for the women of his church. Right. I, I would argue that, that that there's some stuff he's trying to cover up in all of that, or at least advocating for the cover up. But yeah. I don't even have to go there. I was just dumbstruck. So as I watched this unfold in November, I thought, okay, King's birthday is coming in, in January. They're going to celebrate that. I've got to go back and look at this civil rights movement and figure out where in the world did we get the idea that this was okay. Right. And, the more, and the more and more I studied it, the more and more I unpacked it, the more and more I began to see what, what I saw. So the reason for studying dead men is because their impact and legacy still lives today and it's having a negative impact on the church. And again, if what I've written so far has hurt your feelings, you don't really get your feelings hurt next week when I come out with this article about what happened to the black church. Oh. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to need a pacemaker when I'm done with you. <laughs> oh my God, he wasn't ready. I, I don't know. Schedule may not permit. I don't know. I, what I might do is just analyze your article if I can't get you back on because I'm dying to get my hands on that one because I, I get a lot of pushback because I'm critical of the black church. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not. I'm, no, I'm, I'm critical of false Christianity masquerading itself. Yes. As the church of the living God. And yes. if you happen to share my ethnic image, yes, I'm, I have that smoke for you. I do. Because I'm like, you, no, you don't get a pass. Like it, I'm an equal opportunity um, offender. So mm -hmm. we have another question. Someone says, can you touch on other areas affected by race riots as well? To my understanding, there were several others that we weren't exposed to in mainstream history. Are you able to speak on that? Yeah, I, 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 and I'm trying to flush out what's being said there. What, what took place right after the, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 64 uh, and, and, right, and right after, a little bit before King died, but definitely after King died. Here you had a, a, a white populace who allowed their legislators, allowed the, the, the government to enact this, the, the Civil Rights Act. And their thought is the predominant culture thought, oh, okay, this is great. We've, we've healed racial relationships. We're good to go. It's all, everything's great. And what took place was, it, it was the same thing that happened after Obama. Here, everyone was excited about the fact that we had this black president, but racial relationships at the end of his presidency are actually worse than they were before. Well, the same thing happened after the Civil Rights Act of 64. The rest of the country is, is breathing a sigh of relief, thinking, oh, now we've got everything we need. Right after that, the Voting Rights Act is passed, and the thought is everything's going to be great. But what took place right after that were riots out in California. And then after King died, the whole country was aflame. And uh, folks Why began was to, that? Huh? Do you, was it just people just angry that he was assassinated, and that was yeah. their response, so just tear up your stuff? That was in that was that was in part, but they were also pushing the idea. Now, now the idea that equal outcomes were not enough. Whatever they gained from the Civil Rights Act, it was not enough. And so the language that you hear today is there's been a lot done, but there's more still to be done. And so that's now the mantra that 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 you continue. There's more to be done. Hey, you, you even heard it with uh, with uh, uh, Joe Biden when he came down to Warnock's church. Uh, on Sunday to preach. I was actually on a, a family research uh, a council's uh, uh, page. I was on a Washington watch with, with Tony Perkins. Uh, and we were talking about, about this whole issue with, with Biden, a uh, professed Catholic, preaching at a, at a Protestant church on the Lord's Day and how backwards that was. But that's a whole nother conversation. But at the, at the end of the day, all of the mantra is there's more left to do. Well, these blacks who had seen great strides in the defeat of Jim Crow, uh, in the voting rights legislation being in, enforcing what the Constitution had already provided us, there were additional there were additional uh, uh, protections that were in, that were instituted. That was still not enough. And the mantra for that was because right after that, King King got those uh, rewards or, or 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 rights, equal rights. But then began to talk about he began to, to push forward his agenda of the people's campaign. Right. right. And so now you, now you got the poor people's campaign and that's being pushed forward. So it's, it's the constant idea of victimhood status. 
and if, mm-hmm. if you're if you're a victim and, and the, the message to the victim is the, the way that you get your voice to be heard is through tearing up stuff. Right. That, that's that's <laughs> that, that's what's that's what's being said. Well, well, the, the voice that's of a the, Marxist uh, it idea. Is. It is. That's it where is. BLM got it from. They're trained Marxists. Absolutely. The voice of the the voice of the powerless is tearing up cities and rioting. So that's that's the voice of the of the powerless. So that's that's what they that's what they allow. Wow. OK, someone um, had a, oh, I have so many good questions here. So one we have, why is there no pushback from African-American men toward the government during the time? Why was there no pushback during the time when the government was courting African-American women to become dependent on it? That is a good question. That's a great question. That's a great question. Well, where the, the were reality, you? Yeah, the, yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I think when when you look at the the structure the of of the way men are the way women are uh women have a need for someone to provide and and mm-hmm. when there's not a need to provide men are going to abdicate uh, uh, unsaved sinful men are going to abdicate their responsibility to 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 provide so if they can not have to provide but still engage in sexual activity that's exactly what a what a what a reprobate uh un, ungodly unholy man is going is going to do and now there was now that now that there was incentive uh to, to to do just that uh you, you didn't have any kind of a moral framework like you did previously by the time of the, the of the Moynihan report uh, you had 25%, which was, which was, which was high at the time. You had 25% of, of black women having, uh, you know, having babies to, to, you know, six single mothers, uh, outside of wedlock, 25%. Now we're, now we're upwards of, of high seventies and, 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 and at 25%, it was catastrophic. So, so you had an epidemic of, of folks not taking the taking care of their responsibilities, men who were abdicating those responsibilities. Responsibilities. Women are in place to control that and, and to say, no, we ain't having sex until you do this, this, and this, and provide this, this, and this, and then put a ring on it. And so Come when on. you don't have that because they're being provided for, but they still want the pleasure of the sex along with these depraved men who want to provide it, then <clears throat> you get what you get. Right. And I would also say feminism played a role. Feminism oh, you're exactly right. kind of told black women, you know, we hitched our wagon to that movement too. It didn't include us, but we, they used us in order to push their agenda. We end up thinking, oh, I really don't need a man. And then right. here we are. So it's just like, I, I want his seed. I want his provision, but I don't really want him. And then now we have the out of wedlock birth rate that we have. And we're struggling to pair bond with one another because this just this constant distrust. Uh, I was talking to someone today, you know, men feel like, you know, all women want to do is take their kids from them and get get their wallet. But they're not really interested in building and creating a life. And I thought that was just so, so sad. But I can't deny that there's there's some truth to that. There's some truth to that. Um, But that was a great question um another one that we have is come on where is it up why worry about marx mayo freud etc and their views they dead am i right so i'm wondering if we should worry about them or we should not um because i give lots of smoke to uh karl marx i do yeah and now i mean i don't think i've done a show on it but i'm always mentioning marxism and his influence yeah, Ma- Ma- Mao Mao is is more communist China than than anything American, and then Freud Freud's Freud's. I mean, I mean come on, I, the, the the question has got you've got to think through that. All of those ideas, those men uh, who promoted their ideas, are having impact, direct impact on what, how we think uh, about things today. Mar- Marxian influences everywhere uh, in, in culture. Uh, Freud and his agenda as, as per, per, really, I mean, permeates all of uh, all of what we currently see in in, in psychology, uh, even the ideas around sexuality, uh, the ways we think about about you know the, the, the makeup of the of the individual from a from a from a psychological standpoint, rather than as an image bearer of God, recognizing that some of these isms are really sin. Right. Yeah. What, 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 we're, what we're calling an ism is really just sinful behavior being played out in, in, in someone who's unregenerate. Come on. That one was good. 
It it really is. I mean, if you want to, you, you know, racism is partiality based on ethnicity. It's sinful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we we, we want to we. We feel like we need a government program to answer that sin. And I'm like, where do you think that sin is going? I mean, did adultery just go away? No, it's right. going, it's always going to be here. We just need to deal with it biblically, especially as believers. This one was really good. Um, I don't think much of MLK as a Christian, but where would we be without him? Asking for a friend. I know that God is. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I think we'd be just fine without without him. Uh just being honest. Uh Truth be told, I think in many ways we'd be better off uh, with without him. Um, and so I, that, that my my piece made that argument. Uh, what what the legacy that he's left us is one that we're battling today uh, with LGBTQ uh, IA plus rights. Um, we're battling that with with the transgender movement. Uh, the idea that now in an effort to provide equity, uh, children, uh, particularly little girls who feel like they're a boy uh, need, need, to, need to be provided an equitable opportunity to cut off their breasts in order to become the fully functioning male that they desire to be. And they got this agenda from the civil rights movement who were pushing not only for equality, but also for equity of outcome. And so all of this stuff is tied together uh, and it's a good reason why we need to think about it. Uh, you know, most few people really recognize that King was not a Christian. Uh, most right. believe him still to be a reverend. And and even in, we've been we we have a a Pavlovian response to King's preaching, right? Yeah. As soon as you hear the man's voice, that southern drawl, that 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 sound, that cadence. That there's something that happens in us that we we feel the Holy Ghost, right? right. That's kind of what... that with ooh, that's the anointing. It's like no, absolutely, this is absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and so, it, and 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 it's and really the truth be told, if you if you study his theology, uh, it's the farthest thing from from anything biblical, spiritual, or connected with with the truth of the, of the living God. Wow. So here, this is what I wanted to read. It says. One of the hallmarks of the civil rights movement was the idea that integration was the key to future success. And I think most people are arguing like, well, without that, we wouldn't have, you know, the, 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 the um, integration. But it says this was accomplished at the lunch counter and in public education. Yet, how well did it fare? Today's public schools are more segregated than they were in the past and students are not doing better in school. It says people who want you to look elsewhere for solutions while at the same time suggesting that another government program should think about how badly this strategy has worked so far. Even though it's good for blacks and whites to enjoy the same public spaces, eat at the same lunch counters, and use the same restrooms, relying on government actions, whether civil or not, is not a good way to solve the problems facing the black community. And it, it basically Booker T. Washington understood this in the 1800s. And I think because so many of us are ignorant of history is why it's so hard for us to accept that statement from your article, Virgil. I'm, I, mean, I mean, you're talking to someone I was just like, yeah, but integration was good. Like, I want to be able to, well, Woolworth doesn't exist anymore. I want to be able to go to Walmart, you know, I want to, or not, I don't, but I want to have the right to, but then in the next breath, I'm like, yeah, but I like the fact that I own my own business and I can determine the terms in which I do business. I like having that too. But like you said, you, you think that we're probably worse off one because the gains that we did obtain, it came with so much other baggage. And so, so let me ask you this, is your final conclusion that you think we would have achieved the things such as integration and just being treated equal? Would we have been able to achieve that without the civil rights movement? Do you think that? We, like, we, we don't were, know what it would look like, but. Yeah, well, I, I do know what it would look like. We, we were all, that was, integration was already taking place. You, you had a massive country, a uh, number of different states. Uh, King didn't go to an all black college. He didn't. He can't. Well, Boston, he was a poor house. Bo Boston, Boston University wasn't all black. It wasn't. So, so the, these, uh, the, the idea that every place and space that we would go was this segregated experience was not true. There was segregation in the South and there were aspects of it where, where certain store and shopkeepers 
enforced it to a greater degree than others. But even in the South, there was integration. Go back and check out uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Booker T. Washington's book. He, he was interacting with white people. He sure he was, was. They were yeah. helping him build his school and giving him money and I mean, doing all sorts of things. Uh, Spelman and Morehouse both were started with money from the Rockefellers. Now, I, I think it was blood money. They probably shouldn't have took that. But it's neither here nor there. Historically, though, the founders of my alma mater were white people. That's where we got the money from to start Spelman College in the basement of Friendship Baptist Church. So just so, saying. So I, my, my, my point is simply this idea that without King, we would have never got a chance to connect with white folk is a myth. We'll never know, will we? We'll never, we'll never really know how the tide, if, if the tide was indeed turning in our country, like you say it was, we just, some people will argue, well, we, the, the civil rights movement sped it up because it demanded that desegregation happen. Now, now, like I grew up in the North, my mom grew up in the sixties. And when I asked her, about well her memories of the civil rights movement she was just like we were kind of up here minding our business we didn't really know what was going on down there until it came on the news you know she was just like they had racism in new york but it was just different it you know she was like it is it, it is what it is you just learn to live and navigate through it um but the argument of you know like somebody was just like well how do you think you have the ability to have a youtube show who paved the way for you I mean, is the argument that King allowed me to be on YouTube? I, I don't know if I'm willing to. I don't want to dis, disparage the foundation that many people laid. Like, for example, I would attribute the hard work of Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass um, as contributing to why I am outside of the sovereignty of God, but who I am today. It was those ideals and their worldview that actually shaped mine to make me believe that I could actually accomplish these things. It really wasn't um, Dr. King and his work, but I get why some people are like, you just need to pay homage and give respect because of what he accomplished. I, I get it. I, I get it. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying here. Like I'm trying to come <laughs> a little bit. I get it. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, think, I think that's fair. I have no problem acknowledging the fight of King, the stand that King took, <clears throat> but to attribute where I am in life to, to what he did, I, 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 the only one gets glory for that is God. And so it makes people angry. Well, I mean, that, I know well meaning that, church yeah, folk yeah. are upset that you would say that because they would yeah. say, You are speak, you're just being ungrateful. And you're not recognizing that those dogs and those hoses, like those people sacrificed their life so that you could be on the YouTube speaking freely without worrying about a cross being burned on your lawn. Yeah, I, I, I hear that. I get that. Um, but there were people long before King who had tremendous success who were dealing with greater levels of racism and segregation that 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 made it. Um, and, and, it, and it was it wasn't easy, but That's they did it. Exactly good that yeah. you're right i don't think you know what it is we're not thinking through this we're not thinking through like okay how do we have people like a ben carson you know how did we have you know the garrett a morgans you know the 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 uh what, what's the what the, the hot comb lady uh uh tell me out bro was is the uh is it a washington what's uh no, the 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 Madam C J Walker. Madam C J Walker, these that's right. People, these people, my, my, my namesake, my namesake. Right, these people who accomplished much. Mill first, first millionaire, millionaire, right. and a woman at that. I, I'm just, I get it. I just think we so, want so not, to none have. Of that she she would have never been able to do what she did unless King showed up, right? No, I, I I just think people are they take issue with it because it's like. Leave the idol alone. Let us relish in what he accomplished. And there's no need for us to talk about shoulda, coulda, woulda. I, I really think that's pr probably where most people are. Me, I'm, I, I, I like the controversy. I'm like, well, did we leave room for the possibility that this just wasn't that great? I mean, I'm contrarian by nature. I, I can't, I, I want to explore the question. I want to be able to have these dialogues and say, but did you know this? 
especially for Christians. Now I get the secular humanists, they don't they don't care about any of the, his theological issues because they're like, well, shoot, I ain't a Christian anyway. I don't believe in right. the virgin birth right. or the resurrection. Right. Um, but for, for us, these things do uh do matter. Do you have any final thoughts? What yeah. is the takeaway that you want my audience to have? Yeah. Um, I don't even care if people like you or not, but <laughs> just, right. I, I'm looking. I'm looking at this. I, I bought this book after doing the uh, Uncle Tom Two movie. It's it's called. See if you can see this. It's I love. Called, I've heard about that. It's called True Likeness, The Black South of Richard Samuel Roberts. It's 1920 mm. to 1936, and in the book are just images of. Can you see this? It's uh, trying to focus a little bit. Jason has that book. Yeah. Uh, look at look at that. Yeah. It's images of it's images of folks during that time frame that were taken about and, and, and it tells a little bit about their about their lives and what they were doing. And it's an amazing book, pretty, pretty thick. It's it's pictures, tells about their lives, and then you can go and look historically and see who this person was, what they were doing. And all of this is long before civil rights. These folks were doing incredible things uh, during okay. a time when there was serious segregation. Uh, Jim Crow, uh, all all of that. They were they were doing just fine. Okay, so Lynette wants to know who during that time fought for civil rights and held to good orthodox theology that we could go to. I struggled to find. I mean, I'm thinking I was like Adam Clay Powell. I was like, no, that that, that was that one good. Um, you know, I was trying to think of in a pastoral context who had you know good theology. You know. Right. No, any any time any time you mix a social movement, and that takes priority over the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've got things inverted, and so ah. that's that's what you have. So that was the problem: the fact that there was a, a conglomeration of the social movement and theology is where it was just like why we really can't find someone. Yeah. Um, it, uh, I got it. Yeah, they would. They would. It. They they they, you, they used again. These men used the pulpit for the purpose of promoting a social agenda. Mm. So many of us struggle with that because we have the wrong view of the church. We really believe that the church is supposed to be a socialistic arm to right. the community. So because we already have that wrong view, when you tell someone, when someone's just like, yeah, but. Um, this church over here is they're you're giving out clothes and they got a food pantry and they got this and they got and they got all these social programs and we're like yes we know that um, but we we don't have a biblical framework for that being the purpose right. of the church if you want to quickly speak to that yeah. our, our incorrect view of what the church is supposed to be because I find in the black community we really believe that that is the purpose of the church like when yeah, people well, see what Jamal Bryan is doing they're like that's what we're supposed to be doing I just be right. like no no we not. Yeah, we we don't we don't have a, we don't have a biblical ecclesiology. We don't have a thought process of of of, of pastors who actually shepherd souls. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't we don't we don't have a thought process uh, about being discipled through the Word of God. We don't have a thought process of proper biblical worship, which includes expositional preaching, which includes singing that's theologically sound and robust. We we that 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 the church is not our church, but it's Christ's church, and that we're there for Him. Uh, we're not there for us or for benefits or for gimmies or for freebies or for handouts. Uh, we're, we're there to worship the true and living God. That's what the church is for and about. Uh, once we establish that as priority, our hearts will be filled and we'll have a desire to go into our communities and do X, Y, or Z. But we're not looking for the church to do that on the Lord's Day or in some philanthropic exercise of, of, of outreach. Uh, what we would see is that transforms transformed hearts uh, in, in in the lives of believers uh, give you the desire to do uh, other things, primarily with others who are in the church, and mm. then with 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 extra to those who are outside. Ah, I got it. Me. So basically, being good and taking care of those in the household of faith first, and then from Absolutely. there out. Yep, yeah, that is that is biblical. Um, Someone says, why do you think people want to cling to the title Christian when they reject fundamental Christian beliefs? There was during you think about 
thought during King's lifetime, there was tremendous benefit in being connected to uh, to the church. Tremendous benefit and 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 the idea of holding to a Judeo Christian worldview. I mean, he leveraged the language of the church. He leveraged, you know, even the even the text of Scripture, though he didn't believe in its truths. Mm, yep, that's where we err. That's where we err. Uh, so if we spent more time um, having a biblical worldview, when these movements spring up, we should be able to see like, oh, let's compare this movement to the scriptures. And you'd be like, yeah, there's the flag on the play. I see it. We'll be, we'll be wise and awakened to it because I, like my sister was born in 60, uh, 63. And even though she says she was young, she says she remembered um, in theological circles, the opposition to King. She was like, everybody wasn't on board with Team MLK back then. Yes. They just didn't yes. really yeah. get a platform and you didn't hear about it. But mm -hmm. there were plenty of people who were like, dude, you doing way too much. Yes. And they were accused of being docile. They were accused of not, you know, being down for the struggle. And they were like, no, that that's not it at all. But people didn't want um, to really hear that. I, I do remember yep. that. Um, yep. I remember that. So I think I may have gotten all the questions. I think I did. Um, I don't want to hold Virgil too long. because I'm sure he's got to get home. Like he's still at work. And um, I'm thankful. I'm work, work. I got to get to the house. Right, right. I'm thankful for the time that you've spent with us. This stream has gone a little over. I normally like to cap it two hours. We're 41 minutes over where we are um, supposed to be. So on that note, I want to thank you all for joining us on this evening. I get it. I know I have barked up the wrong tree. I know there are some of my subscribers that are like, you done messed up now, A.A. Ron. I don't know why you thought this was a good topic to address, but here's what I'd like to happen. Even if you disagree, it is okay for adults to disagree and have charitable discourse on issues like this. Can you believe that? I know the culture says that when someone says something that you don't agree with, that you are to cut them off because they are the enemy. But here on the Standard of Truth podcast, I wanted to discuss this one because I know Virgil personally. I know his heart, I can't discern his heart, but I know the heart behind why he wanted to um, author a piece like this because he wanted us to think through a lot of the deeply held presuppositions that we have. And he's trying to get us to keep our, our focus on Christ first and not allow yes. everything that's going on in the culture to influence how we live, move and function. And even if that means my own deeply held presuppositions and um, admiration for a particular figure, even if my own feelings were challenged, I'm willing to do that because I, one, I don't want to be in error too. I hate being lied to. Like when I find out you have lied to me, I'm done. And now I'm going to tell everybody about it. So that's what happened. I, there was some information that I discovered that made me feel some sort of kind of way. Now I'm like, you know what? Now I got to tell. I have to share it. So that was my reason for doing this show. I hope that we can be mature adults and have charitable discourse or push back in the comments. Um, if you're disrespectful, I'll block you, but it's okay. I welcome it. I just ask that you be respectful, you know, and taking my husband and my kids and we, we gonna have some problems. Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, thank you, Virgil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I wish you were here. Be with I you. Oh, you're so Absolutely. kind. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Robert. I said, Hey, I'm going to go home and spend time, spend time with the bride and, and enjoy it. I'm getting ready to head out as well uh, to an engagement here soon. I wanted to do this. I'd look forward to doing this. Please don't let this be the last time we got to connect again. Not at all. I'm going to go ahead and let you run. I'm going to go ahead and drop you out. Um, uh, I wanted to recap something, uh, a live stream that uh, a premiere that I did earlier today. So I'm going to go ahead and let you go. Awesome. Thanks, sis. Take care. You're welcome. Bye bye. All right, you guys. I know I know that was a lot. I know you was not ready. I get it. I get come in. Let's lean in. Here, I want to give you a virtual hug and I want to rub your back. I want to rub your back because I know what it's like if you've believed something all your life. You're just like two plus two is four. 
That is a truth that I've held to because it, 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 they told me it was true. Right? No, let's, let's, bad example. What if someone told you that two plus two was five? And all you know is the fact that they told you that two plus two was five. And then all of a sudden, someone shines the light and was like, you, you do know two plus two is four, right? And you're like, what? No, it's not. Two plus two is five. And they're like, no, no. Let me, let me show you that two plus two is really four. So the first thing you're going to do is like, uh-uh, my mama said two plus two is five. Grandmama and them said it. I even read it in a book in school that two plus two is five. But when someone comes to you and they actually show you with observable reality and objective fact that two plus two is not five, it's four, initially it does make you feel some sort of kind of way. It does. Eventually, so you, the first feeling, you know, it might be anger because now you're mad at all the people who lied to you and told you that two plus two was five and in reality it was, it was four. Then you get mad at yourself because you're like, how did I miss this? Well, at least this is how I think. Speak for yourself. Like, I'm speaking for me. This is how I think. When I get presented with information that makes me feel a certain kind of way, after I get mad at the people who lied to me, then I start looking within like, how did I let this happen? I could have easily counted the objects and said, you know what? Two plus two is not five. Two plus two is four. You second guess yourself. You don't check. You don't search it out and seek the truth. You just accept it to be so. That's what this show did for many of you. For many of you, you were like, you know, I didn't need to know that, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, did not affirm the resurrection or the deity of Christ or that. His main objective was to usher in other things in addition to just desegregating. It was all this other stuff. I didn't know that many of the civil rights leaders that I revered have always been champions for the LGBTQIA plus movement. I didn't know that. I didn't know that every time I casted my vote for the Democratic Party that this is what I was supporting. They never told me. I didn't know. It's okay. Here's what I don't want to happen. I don't want you to receive this information, hear it, accept it to be true after you've searched it out and checked it, and then do nothing about it. Just be like, well, you know, I'm just going to stay with the status quo because that makes me feel better. Because what's going to happen is, one, you're going to be held to account for that. Because it's one thing to be doing something in ignorance, but then when you know better and you choose not to do better and make a different decision, now you're held accountable. So I am hoping that this show allows you to do some self-reflection. I've put links to Virgil's article. He has, if I'm not mistaken, in both of these articles, he has sourced this information. I hope it encourages you to pick up a book, right? Pick up a book, go to your local library. Information is being actively suppressed. So don't be lazy. You're gonna have to search this out for yourself. Actually do the work to find out, is what Brother Virgil was saying true? Is there any room for the possibility that we made some shrines with the civil rights movement, but we probably could have accomplished what, what we gained outside of that movement? Did we really have to hitch our wagon to it? And then let's look at the fruit. Here we are in 2022. Our cities are worse off than they were. Our schools are desegregated more than they've ever been. The quality of our education is low. Single motherhood is up. Black families, what is that? Like, we, there's problems. We have a cultural problem. Our babies are being murdered in record-breaking numbers, and taxpayer money is paying for it. These are things that the Bible-believing Christian needs to think about and needs to question. How have I been contributing to this and Am I actually going to do something about it? I'm not asking you to change your party vote tomorrow and sign up to be a dot in the wool Republican. That, that's your business. You, you can register however you want. What I'm asking you to do, and I'm going to do a show on this. This, this, that, this show, that show is going to make you hurt too, but you're going to be all right. I'll, I'll do a little hugging and I'll rub your back on that show too. We're going to examine the 208-page document of the Democratic platform, the policy. We're going to examine that in light of the scriptures, and we're going to do the same for the GOP. We're going to pull up their policy platform, and we're going to examine that in light of the scriptures. And I don't care which side you land on. I want you to land on the side of truth and biblical inerrancy and truth. 
And if you can reconcile the party platforms from a biblical perspective using scripture in context and say without a shadow of the doubt that the Lord is pleased with the things that you've been championing by how you cast your vote, if you can do that at the end of the day, then ain't nothing else for me to say. But we're, we're going to do it. We're going to examine it. And it's going to hurt because you're going to be like, first of all, I didn't even know that this is what this side was saying. And this side believes this. And that's what they want to push. Well, we're going to examine all of it in light of the scriptures. And that show might be more than two hours. So we may have to do uh, multiple parts to that because DNC policy platform is 208 pages. And in the opening prologue, like the prelude was enough to make me be like, yeah, it's a no for me. I'm I'm a have I mm, I want I ain't able to do it. Just, the opening paragraph, I think they call it the prelude or the prologue. It is problematic if you're reading it through the eyes of a Bible believing Christian. Now if you're reading it as just a little cultural Christian, Christian in name only, and you just you hitch Jesus on to you, it's like he's a backpack, you may not find nothing wrong with it. But we're gonna read it with a discerning eye. So um I love you guys. I, I really do. And that's why I do shows like this. And if it causes people to want to jump ship, I, I get it. I don't do what I, I do what I do for an audience of one, but I do it um, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to be held accountable and I want to be found faithful. And if I can use my platform to enlighten and shed light on the truth that I'm talking about the light that make the roaches scatter when you turn the light on, we, we going to do that. So anyway, Somebody said you might get a YouTube strike on that show. That's possible. But I mean, all I'm going to do is pull up their document and we're just going to examine it in light of the scriptures, right? It's a PDF. It's a PDF. We'll examine it in light of the scriptures. And, um, you know, if that show gets demonetized, that's fine. You know why? Another announcement I want to make for you. So you guys, I'm working on, you know, YouTube has, a membership program that I've been eligible for for a while, but I've never, I've never turned it on because one, I feel some sort of kind of way. Um, just to give y'all a little intel, the way YouTube works, if you have a membership program where people can actually join your channel and pay a fee to be a member, YouTube takes, um, 30% of those, those, those earnings. And I just, as a capitalist, I, I have issues with that, right? I'm more of the how can I control my own content and control the revenue that comes from the labor that I am providing, um, the valuable labor that I'm creating in the marketplace, right? And so I'm going to create my own membership um, program that won't be run by YouTube because what happens is kind of like the government, when you agree to the government's terms, I mean, you have to abide by their rules. And if I turn on the YouTube membership program, that means I'm going to have to abide by their rules. And that means there are certain things that I want to share with my inner circle of subscribers that I can't say on YouTube without getting like what Sister Mary said, a strike. Um, and so in true entrepreneur fashion, I've already started building a platform off of here that when you go to my website, you'll be able to join as a member and I'll have different membership levels. And that's where we're going to have our premium content, content that I can't talk about in the regular YouTube space. For example, I've been dying to do a show on the COVID lockdowns and the restrictions and our government's response. I've been dying to talk about the submuscular injectable biologic known as the COVID vaccine. But every time I try to have that conversation, YouTube tells me, you're not allowed to say that. And I don't like being controlled. You're not going to silence my mouth. I can't, I got to be loose. I got to be free. So for me to be able to speak freely, I have to do that off of YouTube. And so um, my standard home and living lifestyle brand will be launching soon. That's my store where I'm going to be providing you guys with valuable tools and resources to aid in your spiritual growth cute, modest clothes to help you glorify God and look cute while you're doing it. All sorts of things there. That's the standard of truth lifestyle brand. But the standard of truth membership, we're going to have premium level, premium plus and instant access. Three different levels for all budgets. And you get to decide um, which level you want to come in on. But that's where we'll have those conversations. That way I can be unleashed and I don't have to worry about big tech telling me what to say and what to do and how to do it and 
all that stuff. So stay tuned for that. I am on Rumble. Um, what you going on Rumble? I'm on Rumble. Most all of my live streams simulcast on Rumble. Here's the problem with Rumble. It is hard to get people who are used to one platform. It is difficult for them to say, hey, it's difficult for me to get them to go to Rumble and support the channel over there. So I don't want to confuse people. Um, and I know how hard it is to teach old dogs new tricks. And I'm the same way. If it was a content creator that had all this special content, they were like, you got to go to Rumble to watch it. I'd be like, oh, I don't. I like Rumble, but it's a little awkward. I'd rather um do a video here and say click the link in the description box and that's gonna take you to the membership site and then you enter over there we might do that um we'll see we'll see yeah somebody said your podcast title says it all thank you thank you so much yeah rumble is very similar to youtube but they can remove your channel without strikes there is a little bit more freedom of speech over there um for example if you have not seen the documentary died suddenly you need to go over there and watch that um, it will open your eyes. Hopefully you guys heard me say it. I don't know if I'm going to get dinged for saying it, but died suddenly is, is a documentary that's on rumble that, uh, you need to go watch. Uh, yeah. So I would love to hear a show as long as both sides are being examined because I have problems with both. I'm definitely willing to listen. And that's all that I ask. Um, I, I was just recently on a liberal radio show up in Chicago. Like right now, I got smoke for both sides too. I have issues with rhinos and power hungry politicians that they want your vote. But when they get in there, they don't represent your interests. Um, like right now, for example, I'm trying to figure out why my governor is over at the World Economic Forum. Like, I want to know, why are you there? You're supposed to be supporting America first agenda, but you over here with the elites. I'm not saying I know why he's over there. I'm not trying to impugn an ill motive, but I have questions. I have questions, Governor Kemp. Why are you currently attending the World Economic Forum? Just wondering. I think that's a valid question. I saw an interview with him today and a reporter was asking him, why are you here? Do your constituents know you're here? Why are you? Like, he refused to answer. So just Reese, I get it. Everybody go get the smoke. But here's what I don't want to happen. I don't want us to land and say, well, we can't support nobody because no, nobody um, fits the biblical model of perfection. We're not looking for perfection. What we want to do is we want to be educated voters, but we want to be Christians first, meaning we're not hitching our wagon to policies and platforms that are diametrically opposed to things that we know the Lord hates. Just so we might be, we might be able to get a little crumbs. We just got to accept this boo-boo on the side. Like, I don't want a plate of crumbs and then the rest of the plate is full of boo-boo. I don't, I don't want that. And I'll, I also recognize that I'm not going to get everything I want wrapped up in a nice little pretty bow in one politician. Like, I tell you people all the time, I'm not dating these politicians. I don't, I don't have to like you. I don't need you to be my BFF. We, we're not in a relationship. I am hiring you to do a job and I'm looking for the one whose policies align well with my biblical worldview. That's all I'm looking for. And if you land at the end of that show, like, you know what, I'm going to just, I'm going to just register as an independent and I'm going to take each election. I'm going to go candidate by candidate and look at platform. I think that's a good thing. You don't need to be like me. What I don't want us to be is to perpetuate this generation of just blind sheep where we hitch our wagon because it was like, well, grandmama was this and I'm going to vote this because grandma wouldn't steal me wrong. But when we find out the lot of things grandmama did, she did out of ignorance and just did not know. I don't begrudge them for making the decisions that they made if they did not have the information and were not fully informed. But we are without excuse. We live in the information age and we, we deserve and we should Look into the things that we are supporting as Christians. Remember, this melanin is secondary to me. Who I am in Christ Jesus is primary. I just so happen to get a little extra side of melanin as the cherry on top, but it is, it is not the main thing. I don't lead with my ethnicity. It's just how the Lord made me. I lead with my identity and who I am in Christ. And that's all that I want for my audience. And I'm hoping that you understand and hear my heart on that. 
So anyway, someone says, I love your motto, flat-footed and guns a-blazing all the time, sis. Matter of fact, Purple Rain is sitting right over there. So y'all, I got to go. I got to go pick up my mama. Uh, tomorrow, my children um, are being honored at a magazine release party. There was this uh, article done on them and their business. So I got to go pick up mama for that. And um, then I got a hair appointment on her because y'all, it's look, mm, y'all see all this back up here? The girl looking rough, but it's nothing I could do. I couldn't make it look no better than what it is. It's because it needs to be done. So I don't think, I don't, I, I may not, do, I might do a show tomorrow. I am not sure. But the next time y'all see me, it's going to be laid. Like all this back, yes, it's going, mm, it's going to be right. It's going, it's been about eight weeks. So it's time. I love you guys. I love you with the love of the Lord. Until next time, grace and peace.